That's what you said, and I think that's way better. Bang at Olufsen. They're Olufsen. banging. Olufsen. Tell you what, they're nice headphones. They're expensive though, but they're worth it. Absolutely worth it. But and I'll buy them again. But slightly uncomfortable for you. Yeah, they need to work that out a little bit more, in my opinion. They need to make their own sleeve that fits over the top of their what they believe to be appropriately padded. Hey, this is interesting. Do you know what this sort of headphone is called? Now, the kind you have to? Can I can I point out that we started part one with a little bit of this, but why don't you remind the folks what you call over the ear headphones? I don't. It's what they are called. Well, yeah, no, Cir not not what you call them. Yes, what, what right. they are called. Right, circumoral. Circumoral, because they yeah. go around the ear. I mean, that's the scientific name for them. And I just thought, how many studio people know that? Nobody. I've been asking everybody. Now, what Nobody about in-ear? What are those suboral? I don't know that they. I don't. I haven't. I haven't read their, you know, their specific scientific name. Their yeah. classification name, but these are circumoral. So perhaps. Hmm. Right. All right. Well, thanks for coming. And oh, and listen, it is not just like ones that go over your head and have little things that just no, 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 no. Ears. It has to go over the ear, over your whole ear apparatus. Right. The the the, the entire the lobe and pinna, all of that, that, that is the in the cup thing of your ear. Right. Right. Yes. So we got. That. I once heard from Dan Lanois that Brian Eno, when they were mixing a Brian Eno thing up in Canada that they put, sitting in front of the speakers, they put packing, like they made packing blanket ponchos, put those on and then created like ear um, extender pieces out of whatever material they used. I like can't remember what it was. Bottles. No, like things they could form into more like ears, you know, that were, were con like shaped like an ear might be shaped, but just much bigger and sat there and listened to music. And how'd that work out? I don't know. I don't know, but I could imagine it. Yeah. I don't know that that would translate much, would it? No, it wouldn't. It would just be weird. But, you know, sometimes if you could just push your ears forward and listen to things, things sound completely different. Oh, of course. But that's yeah. cheating because nobody lives like that. And so yeah. you can't, like, think, oh, no, it's brighter. I but, guess I have enough high end. But little tip. If you're in like a noisy room, which of course none of us have been in a noisy crowded room in 18 months, but the next time you are in one in approximately 12 months when this shit's finally settled down, if you're having trouble hearing someone in a conversation, a little cup of the ears, true. really easy to focus. It's true. Really easy. You know what though, on that note, if you are in a clouded club, a clouded club, <laughs> a crowded club, I have learned my lesson and somebody comes in and they want to talk into your ear, boy, you got to be careful. Yeah. Because I had one person yell something into my ear that hurt so much that I actually thought you just deafened me, motherfucker. Um, so now I'm real skittish. And did you, start did you clock in. them? No, but I, I still, I'm still angry at that. I still don't like that person. Right. I didn't like them before. Now well, that, I okay. Like, I was going to okay. ask like, if that yeah. was the deciding factor. If, but you I, know. you know, it, how that didn't occur to me to never let anybody that near my ear again, ever under any circumstance, unless I'm positive they're going to whisper. Um, yeah, I'm on it. Yeah. Don't come near my ear. Let's not do it. Now, look, you brought up Canadians. And there's something you alluded to in part one, which I just wanted to check out. So you talked about how at Kingsway, they were all thought of as like some weird cabal of crazy people in the midst of the voodoo capital of the United States. Right. But you alluded to there being something in your upbringing that made you innately frightened of Canadians anyway. Hmm. And I'm curious if there is something, some incident involving Canadians early on. Well... You don't have to go there if you don't want to. It was just like. I think, I don't think there was an incident. I think that it would have had, because when I just allow myself to, to have that thought be inside me, I did growing up, we had a certain suspicion more of Canadians. And I think it's because I'm a Great Lakes person. Right. So there you are, like right at the little toe of Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes are also Canada. You know, they traverse the great. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, in Michigan, it's a big, you're like right there. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, and I'm near Chicago, but nonetheless, you're still attached to the Great Lakes. It's very much an identity. It's not a Midwestern identity. It's certainly not like a Yankee. So you're a Great Lakes person. 
and there were there was Canada infiltration all the time. And for some reason, I think that I I wasn't afraid of Canadians. It was just I think they I don't know they were seen as the others on the other side of the lake. Interesting. So I, and I love Canada and I love Canadians. I adore them. But I, you know, I was afraid of these Canadians. I was far more afraid of what they were versus like, yeah, the, the voodoo. Wow. <laughs> that was not so frightening what, to me. What was it that they were coming over the border to do? And I thought they were just buying beer, but. I'm, t- I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember what made me worried about Canadians as a kid. Cause something worried me about Canadians yeah. as a kid. And there could have been a Canadian in my rather wild, rather um, vibrant, but also scary childhood that, that, that I think there was a Canadian whose name was Dave. I'm not gonna give his last name because he was involved in a murder and that murder touched my life um, very specifically. And I think he was Canadian. Right. I'm gonna go with that because it actually gives me a super anxious feeling. So I think this dude might've be been- it. Canadian and right. so well let's let's move but, on I didn't mean but, you know, to... there was like Neil Young I, I didn't like blanketly like oh this doesn't count Vancouver they're different Canadians on that end of the scope well you know nor... land border instead of a sea border yeah and nor does it cover Quebec because that's France you know when you're a kid but there was something about the Canadians attached to the Great Lakes and I think sometimes serial killers from the U.S. used to boogie across the lakes you know and get up into Canada pretty easily so it always seemed like that frontier to me had something to do with serial killers. Right, right. So like Fargo in real life, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, that's as best as I have. All right, good. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. So I <laughs> just, just wanted to clear that up. <laughs> I didn't mean to get you all, all feeling, you know, Scared. uneasy. So, and now no. I feel like Canadians are going to be like, fuck you, bitch. <laughs> what are you talking about? So it wasn't ca- Canadian people as much as it was this this borderland thing. Right, right. No, fair enough. I mean, it's it's just they're the outsiders as yes. well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a world where it was so strictly Catholic, you know, in my very young years, that there was only Catholics and everybody else was considered a massive outsider. Um and oddly, it wasn't as racial either, because if they were black Catholics, that's fine. You know, it, it was just this this weird it's us against them. And then I think that leaks. Of course, I became atheist right away, even at like age eight. I figured it out. But um, that early clannish behavior right. you know, was always lurking around. And then they were Irish, too. So that was clannish and Slovaks. Right. So everybody seemed real clannish to me. It's yeah, the middle of the country can get like that. I mean, you've got your your Norwegian communities and your like there's yeah. real multi generational stuff yes. going on there. I have to itch my ear. Uh, okay, Ariel, careful, uh, careful. <laughs> Don't yell into my own ear with my pinky. No, exactly. And your pinky is is big is smaller than your elbow, and that's the smallest thing you're ever supposed to put in your ear though if you could get your elbow into your ear then you've got other issues I you think. do i think i um the, you know the kingsway I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those particular canadians um you know i was more frightened of them than i was the myself being alone in new orleans trying to you know survive having no car no car insurance obviously because i didn't have a car no medical insurance living you know, in different places, sleeping on couches, trying to figure it out. And I was working at studios and cleaning studios, um, but those studios, Ultrasonic and Sea Saint and, you know, these, um, they were, they were like studios, they had control rooms and they had carpet, you know, like ugly orange carpet ish, you know, like the lounge and they were set up like studios and they felt like studios. And they also had you know, local musicians often and all that just seemed very normal to me. There was no, there was nothing famous. There was nothing wealthy. There was, you know, there was, you would occasionally see Alan Toussaint. And of course that was like seeing a Titan and, you know, those, but it, it, it felt very rural. 
and very and therefore to me very familiar, even though it was a city and even though it was a southern city on the Gulf where I did not come from. But knowing that the Canadians that were up in that mansion were famous, rich, others, and then I, you know, you'd see them around town. And this was during the time when like interview with the vampire was being filmed by Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise, and they were actually coming by Kingsway. So, you know, you would see them lurking around. When I first went, this was a few years earlier, but the whole Anne Rice interview with the, the vampire thing. So unlike anybody else in New Orleans who didn't dress that way, the Canadians all seem to be wearing the long flowy vampire shirts and like leather pants. It's really hot in New Orleans. So very few people actually wear leather. Yeah. And um, people really do wear linen, you know, cause linen breathes and cotton and whatnot. And so they're kind of dressed the part of the scary vampire ish people yet the real people who felt like vampires in new orleans weren't dressed that way um so it's just it was almost comical but and there was also you know there was always like the weird sexual overtone too to like ooh, what if they're into like kinky shit you know and so i don't know there was a mystery about it because they were outsiders and i and i had worked in new orleans for months before i had ever gotten you know my my pass into the mansion right. and so it had built up enough of a kind of like weird mystique that probably made me think that i was more scared because they were canadians than drug dealers that lived you know next door who were real nice to me <laughs> well you know and it turns out partially you weren't wrong and right you know. correct anyway anyway we, we we spent quite a bit of time on on the whole Kingsway part of things. So we can pick up on our sort of chronological journey if you'd like, but then we have yep. some, some big picture stuff I'd love to spend some more time on. But we stopped right before Joe Cocker. We mentioned him. He was amazing. We didn't talk about him. So should we just nope. pick up on that? Sure. Um, I remember that John Shanks was producing that record. Um, and... He had me track it. He did, or parts of it. And it was at Hanson, which you know was AM in LA. And um, who's that real strong arm drummer that hugs really hard and is fun to be around and plays the shit out of drums? Of course, Kenny Aronoff. Oh, right. You yeah. know, he's like, oh, yeah, you know, you shake his arm and he's just like made of steel. And you know, he's really fun to be around. And um, I was a greenhorn still then. I, I was didn't know what the fuck I was doing, but I was just like trying to get sounds. I, I still don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I get sounds. And so and then Joe Cocker showed up and of course he was just like, you want him to be polite and amazing. And um, still, you know, this was funny because I didn't spend a lot of time around a great deal of celebrities of the era that I worshiped. And when you see Joe sing, he's always got that, you know, the thing that he does, yeah. of course. So, and again, this is pre I'll Google it, or if Google was Google didn't maybe was around, but like I couldn't just Google right away, Joe Cocker. <laughs> you know, what I didn't know about him, like I'd never looked up in the encyclopedia, are Joe Cocker's physical movements when he sing and is he have an affliction exactly that he does that all the time. And of course he does not. So all that is part of what happens to his body when he is lost in in his his voice and his in his delivery. So then that would beg the question, okay, well, do you have to do that? Or like how natural is that? Or how much of that is part of your persona? Whatever, right? So the dude gets in front of the microphone and we're on NS10s and I'm looking through the window. And you do have that trippy moment. Again, there's people who record celebrity all the time. So they probably don't have this, or maybe they do, but I was freaking out. Um, and so he starts singing and his voice comes out of the speakers and it's Joe Cocker. You know it is because he's standing in the room and you already met him and he was real nice. And um, But then the voice comes out of the speakers and I just about passed out because it's him and he sounds magnificent. And um, and he's he, right away, it wasn't quite as, 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 as huge as like the live footage I've seen of him because he's in the throes of a live performance, but yet that hand kind of, did the thing and he's yeah, got the, the shoulder going and, and yeah. singing. And I was, 
I, I literally, I, I wasn't even paying attention to the faders or the levels or anything like that. Cause I knew, I, I think I was just a sit-in engineer. I was just doing something for John for a day or two. It wasn't like you're on this whole record or maybe I was on it for he like a week and a half or two weeks. It was a little bit of time, but it, was, it didn't feel like the whole thing. I don't remember to tell you the truth. Because Joe did, wasn't there all the time. I think we got a lot of the tracking and Joe would come in for vocals. And I don't recall always being present for Joe's vocals. But so blown away. You know, and I just wanted to sit near him. I just wanted to hear him speak. I wanted to hear him tell stories of the old timey days. Not that he was like done and this was like a comeback record. But, you know, like the, the days that I still, obviously, I've said before, live in and grew up in. And uh, mostly I just wanted to sit by him. Um, when he was in the control room and listened to him talk, and look at him. And I didn't speak to him a lot. I didn't ask him questions. I just wanted to be near him and his voice. Like I can, if I could have licked his voice coming out of the speakers, I would have. <laughs> I mean, I got my face right up in there. I even wanted to smell his breath. The only time I can stand stinky breath is when it's a great singer singing and I like have to get near it to do something to the microphone or whatever, even if their breath stinks fine that's fine really it's the only stinky breath i'm going to tolerate yes so as soon as they're done with the take you give them a piece of gum i would give them floss um right so start yeah, there piece, yeah start there <laughs> no there's just something about being in the actual physical proximity to an not a, just a good voice i'm talking about an iconic voice it has to be iconic, not just great. And then they can have stinky breath. Joe Cocker, I don't know that he did or didn't. He never sang right into my face. But if like, if there was an iconic singer and I'm talking about the great ones, I would pay them a thousand dollars to sing this far from my face. And I would just open my mouth and I want them to sing right into my open mouth. Really? It's in my, it's in my book, my heroine has a singer who, she calls it voice fucking. Yes. <laughs> well, and of course I made her up. So the things that she wants to have done are things that I would probably consider. So yeah, I just wanted to sing this far away from my mouth, sing their voice into my mouth, not touch me, just sing it right into my mouth. I would love that. And so it's, but, I imagine it's a pretty short list of people. It's a pretty short list and most of them are dead. So sadly. You know, but Taj Mahal's not. I'd get Taj Mahal. If Taj Mahal ever watches this, which he won't, but if any of y'all know Taj Mahal, he lives in Hawaii, I think. Tell Taj he can sing right into the tree's mouth and I'll pay him to do it. <laughs> this far away. This far away, you know? I just want to hear, got a bird, won't a whistle, oh, baby got a bird, honey got a bird, sang. And Fuck the thing yeah. is, like, you're not just saying that. Like, you would actually really... That's, I would fly to Hawaii to you do would it. Love, I couldn't afford that and paying him. Yes, no, I would love it. He'd have to do it for free if you were paying for the flight. Yeah, and I've had a couple people get close enough with their mouths where I was like, uh-huh, you know. But then I started fantasizing about, like, what if it was Otis Redding? What if it was Ted Neely? <laughs> you know, what if it was one of those dudes? What if it was Paul Rogers? What if it was Sly Stone? You know, those are the voices that I get off on. So... Um, and they could be old men now too, won't matter. It's just the, the, the thought of it. You know, it wouldn't have to do it over and over again, just like you don't have to have sex a thousand times with somebody to have liked it. You know, so it would, it would be like having sex for me. So you've got like a free pass list with your husband for people to sing into your mouth. Oh yeah, he wouldn't care. Yeah, no, he didn't care. He already knows about this fantasy. It's really interesting because of course it's, I mean, the breath coming out of their mouth is the only tangible thing that is their voice other than a recording yes. of it. Yes. And that's just a transitional phase waiting for it to appear back at my ear hole and, yeah. and, and vibrate. So, But you want to breathe singing, it in. Yeah. As you're singing into my mouth, I'm obviously hearing it. But, you know, we hear inside our mouth, too. Like right now, I'm starting to chomp some gum. So it's super loud in my mouth because you're tympanic, like your shit's right there. Your ears are right next to your throat. So how you hear your head voice is because it's echoing in your mouth, you know? So I talk and I'm hearing it all up in my brain and my skull. So then I figure if they're singing right into my mouth, I might even get close to hearing it almost as a head voice. 
and like we hear our own voice. But what if what if you didn't like it as much hearing it? Because nobody likes the way their voice sounds when they hear a recording of it because it's so different from what it sounds like in their own head. Right. What if you no, didn't like it? There is no chance that a sly stone got up in my shit and sang K Sara Sara <laughs> into my mouth that I'm not gonna like his voice less because it's resonating in my skull. All right. From the opposite direction. There's no chance of that. All right. <laughs> all right I'm... you get you people out there in the world all three of you who are looking at this thing are getting to learn all about the real train not the fake train or like the front train it's the real train <laughs> it's the freight train <laughs> the freight train <laughs> all right so let's keep going with all right yeah, well let's joe keep cocker. going because cause... joe cocker blew my mind so joe cocker and then you also you did a record that was bruce springsteen adjacent yeah, <laughs> I was a sidecar, man. I was on a sidecar. Yeah, but boss. like literally, right? Yes. I mean, yes. This is I. I just love this story. So if you want to tell the the story, well, I got a call from Patty Scalfa, who is an amazing artist in her own right, of course, and and is also Bruce's wife, and and sings with the E Street Band, to work on Patty Records. And Patty worked at their studio, she and Bruce's studio in Rumson, New Jersey, which was on their property. I think they have new stuff now, like a new house and a new studio, but nonetheless, and she flew me up and I went out to the Springsteen, you know, house and studio and uh, for a, quite a long time for the length that it took to make two records. So spread out over a few years, back and forth up to New Jersey, hanging out with Patty and hanging out with Bruce. and. You know, I occasionally still have dreams about them and being on their property because it was so overwhelming. Not because I, I talked about celebrity recently when I, I did do a Showtime interview. Um, they're doing a, a, pro, a, a documentary on Sheryl Crow. So a few weeks ago, Showtime had me come up to Nashville and film me for this documentary. And I talked to them a lot. And I did talk to them about my feelings about celebrity and what celebrity really is. Um, and along those lines, celebrity to me is not a person. Celebrity is a construct on top of a person that they are required to maintain. We are celebrity, the people who determine that they are special enough to merit our attention when they're not really part of our lives except for what it is they do that has caused us to want them in our lives that we construct like your cat house right there, your cat tree, the celebrity on their shoulders. So Bruce and Patty were celebrities and obviously very, very wealthy people. But what they really were, were Bruce and Patty Springsteen, right? And, and so you get near them and they're magical. They're, they are, Bruce Springsteen is a magical cat. And he just, everything about him he doesn't know this about himself. I mean, not that I'm his best friend, but he was real kind to me and he was very open. And um, there's something about him that's like ethereal. He could, he would hate hearing that because he's just a Jersey dude who always stayed that way and is real easy to be around, but not really. There's something about him that's uh, another dimension. And so you get excited anytime he just walks in the room. Patty has that too which is probably why they got along. So she has this energy that just fills you with, it makes you feel energized too. And it makes you feel special. And they showered it on me. They never were like, we know we have magic, special energy and we like to keep it only to ourselves. They only share it with like Tom and Rita Hanks who are coming over for dinner, <laughs> um, who also were real cool. Um, so, but they wanted you to feel like you were part of it and, and had it too. And they just always showered me in their magic fucking sprinkle dust. And um, and Bruce, yeah. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on the air. So I, I don't know if I should or not. Do you think, I, I'm not gonna. I have no idea what it is. So I, only you can you can say. But uh, this is really truly live, right? Yeah, like it's, going people, out, it's going out live it's going and then out it's on YouTube world. forever. Right I'm, gonna, after. I'm gonna mask it. Okay. To say that sometimes things that could be seen as wrong turn out to be right and great and perfect in that moment, a very healing. Um, and I'm not alluding to any kind of like sexual stuff between me and the Springsteen's, there wasn't any threesome. 
they were physical people. I was a single woman at the time and I wasn't a person that ever was out like, hey, hit on me. I was, I'm like I am now, I'm weird to be around. I'm very hard to be around in some ways, but also not like, hey, I'm gonna go approach that chick. I don't come off that way. So, but they were physical people and they, they were physical with me in like really beautiful ways. Like Patty would come up behind me and like rub my scalp like she would her daughters or something. And she wasn't that much older than me. We're, we're more peers in age, but like mess with my hair and like rub my hand. And Bruce was the same way. So Bruce would give you like touches that were, okay, I'll just say it. He would touch me, but it was never like, ooh, he's being weird. And that's sexual harassment. It was never like that. It was like comfort. It was like, she's lonely. I'm a man with a beautiful wife and three beautiful children and I am not lonely, but she is, and I can see it. And I think that she could use a pat on the back right now, a little rub and also something to make her feel beautiful because she is, you know, like she needs attention yet she won't ask for it. She works herself like an indentured servant in here. And I'm gonna make her feel pretty and special because I'm the boss and, I can, and he would. And it always like filled me with this super, super woman energy. He never hit on me. It was never weird ever. It was a gift from a sexy man who ruled the fucking world to show me little pimply, skinny, lonely Trina who only had gear to be her friend that she was noticed. I think some people can misinterpret those things and call them Maybe they're, I don't know why they would do it. I still to this day feed off those few beautiful, and not just from him and from Patty too, and others on that level that could fill you with power feelings. Hey, they weren't going to pay me a whole shitload of money. It wasn't going to be like, now you're going to have points and we're going to, it was like, you are in our presence for a limited amount of time. And we are going to, you're going to leave here feeling more powerful than you arrived. And it'll have nothing to do with the record. And they liked me. I'm not friends with them now. They don't call me. I don't know them. You know, they probably don't remember me. They might remember my name and they probably remember a little bit, but I remember them a lot more. Well, I don't think they have dreams about walking around their property. So let me ask you a question. The Going back to your definition of celebrity. So celebrity is then how we would perceive them yes. when they come out into the world. But there's no denying that they've got something within them because i mean there are certain people who walk into a room and you have no idea who they are but you know there's something yes. special it is a magnetic personality it is born leadership you know all these people also they yeah they can suffer from depression or have all kinds of normal yeah. human but they are magnetic they are they are attractive they are givers of energy they are people who are able to, I would say that they're almost more like catalysts where energy comes into them and they're able to use it in ways that put it back out and you feel it. And, and these people are all over the earth. They walk the earth constantly. We, you know, because I'm a music person and I love music. And so I'm more usually focused on that construct, which surrounds the artists whose music moves my world and the celebrity upon them, but there would be celebrity built on anybody who has that magnetic personality that attracts literally strangers into their midst. Jesus as a walking human would have had a massive celebrity tower built on him and all kinds of people got it. So, but then there's the person who also is magnetic, but is damaged enough where they perceive the celebrity that which we put on them to actually become a real facet of themselves. And then it becomes entitlement. And it's no longer celebrity. It's just entitlement. And that's bullshit. Right. That's so, where the celebrity ends and this entitlement behavior begins. And that's not acceptable. Well, so the celebrity that we're projecting onto them is the same. It's just they don't have the special qualities within to support it or something. Well, they do. I would say that they absolutely do. They have that magnetism, but they have a damaged version of it. Right. Therefore, I'm trying, I guess I'm bringing this back to Bruce, who's obviously a massive celebrity. And, but when he comes and sits down next to you in the room, he really feels like a dude from Jersey 
who grew up middle working class acts that way, feels that way, is that way, didn't change out of that, didn't shrug it to the side, and yet he glows. So his celebrity, he, he it just I would just look at him and think it's just on him what we do to him, what we want from him. And it's got nothing to do with this guy who's sitting here. And I've been around other celebrities who their celebrity kind of, I guess it maybe sunk down into their shoulders and became this huge hulking mass that was on top of them. And it was very laborious to be around and very unpleasant. That didn't make their music less amazing, but it definitely made me not want to be around them. Right. I guess I'm just likening it's how all human beings are, but celebrity really is this, and it's a burden because a person who can't handle that weight that we put on them really has to haul it around like a ball and chain. I don't, I, I do not envy celebrity. I don't want to be one. And the people who are forced to deal with it, I feel bad for them. No, I mean, you can easily go the other end of the spectrum to Kurt Cobain or someone like that right. who, who couldn't handle, I mean, you know, and there can be other stuff involved as well with it, but I'm just wondering only because I would Kurt Cobain have shot himself in the head with a shotgun if it wasn't for the construct of celebrity that was put upon him, if he was just a junkie hanging around Washington doing, yeah, shooting up. Don't know. Probably. Don't know. But so, I wonder if I, this, the, the magnetism, the thing that radiates, like, because at first I was thinking, oh, well, maybe it's because they've been able to shed self-doubt. Like, I mean, I don't think Bruce has got a whole lot of self-doubt. Oh, he's but, got tons of it. Really? So the same. Oh, so like, yeah. what is it? So is it just this standalone thing that some people have more of than other yes. people? Or is it born out of other things? People, I think, are born with these, this, this, well, I'm sure it's like, you know, part of their child, like part of their coming of age, part of their realization, natural talent, an affinity to focus, the ability to focus, like all of these attributes that make a leader, a leader, a born leader, a, 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 a ruler, a king. Um, now there'd be Kings that are, this actually plays into what's wrong with society and what sexism actually is. It's a feature of that because a leader is a leader. People are born leaders. People are born dominant personalities. I mean, I'm sure it has to, to do with androgens at birth and amount of testosterone when it hits the embryo, like there's physical factors and hormones involved. I'm more of a slightly more masculine woman but I'm totally chick all the way through. I didn't create, like I work out, but I carry a lot of androgens. I'm, I think I was born dominant. I'm a dominant personality. My society says that one, females are not dominant. Females are subservient to males. Males are given dominance by, by merit of their birth, the birthright of, of, of maleness. Even a weak man who is born not dominant, born utterly passive, will be, we'll go back, you know, many years into a more traditional society. They will be given the dominant role, even if they're passive. The woman will not be given the dominant role, even if she is. And then a weak male, or not in a weak, but non-dominant, is also forced to have to carry a dominant mantle, which does not fit them well. They can become violent and aggressive underneath it. They, by the way, dominance doesn't mean that you're a bullying asshole. It means that you're a leader. You are born in a dominant stance. It's like horses. You just happen to be dominant because you're, because you, because you accept it and you go for it. But the the non-dominant male has to dom this, you know. But but again, it's just given to them, and it causes aggression and it causes bad behavior if things were just equal dominant personalities born that way a, a beautifully dominant person is benevolent a negatively dominant person is dangerous and you know a, a horrible thing to be around so dominance is just kind of what you're born with now if you're also born with a dominant personality and a raw talent for something you may just be that person that busts through with with mag magnificent force to be the singer or the scientist or the whatever the the outward pouring of that of that focus and dominance and but our society you know skews things it has to so that 
if I walk into a room of not anymore, cause you know, I'm done, but early on of, of men, some of whom are born dominant, embraced it and are wonderful. Some of whom were not born dominant, but were still handed their dominant mantle. And they're acting that way. I'm born dominant. I'm natural with it. I'm confident with it. I have to go into that room, take over that weak dominant dude, get him under my control, find my way without ever overwhelming the room. I have to do it real subtly. I have to take, I have to, I have to overwhelm that guy and remove his dominance, which he doesn't want anyway, and he can't handle and, and fill the room with mine in the most passive way I can. And then once that's done, everything goes just fine. It was hard to do, you know, I, it, does that make any sense? Do yeah, you understand absolutely. what I'm talking absolutely. about? Absolutely. Absolutely. I it's mean, look, because I see, you know, more nuanced versions of it just in a group of men. And then it's, there's obviously a whole nother thing. Uh, well, you know, growing up as a woman, I had to face everything as a woman. So I just, I know for sure that I love dominant personalities and I am one, but again, dominance does, I watch horses. You, they, they pick their leader every day, the dominant mare or the dominant gelding. I'm not around stallions. So their behavior is of course, not something that's known to me. I mean, I could know what I read, but um, every day you have to assert your dominance, prove that you still know where the water is. You still know where the best feeding is that time of year that you can sort out the problems. So there are just a lot of dominant. There are a lot of people out there that think they were born dominant, but they weren't. And they were just play acting at it or they're forced to play act at it. And I, those personalities are extremely hard to be around. They do populate the music business sometimes and the arts because dominance and talent don't go hand in hand, but natural benevolent dominance and raw talent that's nurtured and then made proficient, those are the stars. Those are those massive personalities that just rise above everybody else and we worship them. They have the construct of, of celebrity, but when they walk into a room that is set aside and they're just there filling you with their fucking coolness. But I don't notice celebrity. I won't even point it out to like, it doesn't exist for me. All that ex exists is if the person is famous, what have they done that has caused them to me to be aware of them and do they find, do I find what they've done to be worthy of my interest? And if it is, I honor that thing that they did that is worthy of my interest, but I would never approach them or never like think that they owe me one more because I'm a fan. Right. And I think you can also appreciate some people's talents and not ever want to have a conversation with them. Not ever, not ever or ever again. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. But Bruce was none of those things. Bruce was the person who you're a big fan girl. You got to squelch that. He comes around. He's more magical than you fucking could have possibly imagined. Cause I was obviously a big fan and anybody's also just like, he's a King. I was like, that's a King right there, man. That's be like sitting next to a King, but he's a King from a working class family. So he's a King that I can get. He's not a blue blood. I'm not sitting next to like, Prince Harry, I would like to, but like, I don't know. He's just regular and he just made me feel good. And so did Patty. And so that's the best. If there's a celebrity that can show us all how to be a celebrity, let's just all say, let's let it be Bruce. Sorry, Bruce, if you're watching this, which you're not clearly, <laughs> but uh, yes. you know, not and I only knew anyway. like there's other people like him, but that happened to be my you know, one that I was like, shit, man, nothing, nothing will be cooler than that. Ever. So you didn't get him to sing into your mouth though, did you? No, but I wanted to. <laughs> I thought about it back in those days. I've been thinking about the mouse singing thing from real early on. The first person who I imagined doing it to me was this guy named Daryl Johnson who worked for Dan. Is it, um, now there's a couple of Daryl Johnsons. Um, one of them plays with the Rolling Stones, plays bass and sings. And then there's, but this Daryl Johnson also plays bass, sings magnificently, plays all instruments. Anyway, he worked for Dan a lot back in those days. And he was always singing around the studio. And he's a real tall black guy with a really fucking cool voice. 
I always wanted Daryl to sing right into my mouth. He would get near when he was like, because he taught me how to sing harmonies. Um, and I'd be near enough, but it wasn't like intentionally sing into my mouth like you're fucking me with your voice. And that's what I wanted to feel like. Are you cool with that? <laughs> you I have yet to actually, because I could get a lot of people to do it to me. It doesn't just have to be a dude. It could be a woman too. But the iconic voice that it would have to be for it to make a difference has yet to get close enough to me for me to be able to say, like, I wasn't going to say that to Bruce. And I, you know, I wasn't fully realized in my longing for this until more recently. Now, have you really had anybody it. do it? Have you? No. Because you, maybe you need to explore this just to see if it's what you think it is. It is. It is going to be. What if it isn't? I've, it will be, though. Okay. There's no way it couldn't be. All right. I've had people singing that close. All they would have to turn is and just do it right here. But understand, it would have to be a song and a voice that is so overwhelming to me anyway how could it be anything but overwhelming think about it think about if otis redding walked into this room right now got right here and sang nobody's fault but my own directly into my mouth <laughs> would you how ever that, exhale again that's what i mean how could that be anything other than the most intense sensual experience that you could have with that man even more than having sex with him his his song went into your mouth i can't explain this any better than this i'm gonna have to i have to really think about who i would want to do it now yeah but none of these none of these guys are going to agree to do it you don't know that rod stewart call him up i don't have his number We'll find you it. You call him up. You know way more famous people than me. No, but I do know. I know somebody plays guitar with him. So you tell them that this girl. You show him this video. Yeah, I'll just show mouth. him the video. That's all that needs to happen. And you that have you to touch me. And right? you've no got touching. No, 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 no touching. And your dental hygiene looks immaculate from here. It is immaculate. Absolutely, I floss. I mean, I don't fuck around with that. Um, but his wouldn't have to be. And so, but you know, I'm really gonna, you know. Yeah, it would have to be somebody on that level. You know what, this, not to offend Mick Jagger, because I adore him too, but I wouldn't want Mick Jagger. I'd want Mary Clayton. Raymond, yeah. <laughs> she could do me with her with her voice. But in a aren't minute. there aren't there a couple there's gotta be a couple of Mick Jagger songs like, oh no, hold on, he could sing into my mouth. I love Mick Jagger is a huge sexual trigger for me. Absolutely. When I think about Altamont and but all But never, that. never singing. His voice, per se, does not hit me in that place that Sly Stones does, Paul Rogers does, Rod Stewart does, Billy Gibbons does, like Taj Mahal, Ted Neely, Carl Anderson. There's a, there's a, there's a, it's a baritone. I have to say, I'm thinking it's a baritone thing. Okay. And I don't, he's not much of a baritone. He's more of a, just a sexy ripper. Now, I'm not saying he's not a fucking stunning singer and shoot... I will get struck down by the god of a fucking British rip rock. Well, look, look. If I'm he sorry. offered to sing, if he offered to sing "Wild Horses" into your mouth, you'd let him. Yes, I would let Jagger sing. Yes, okay. I would. Yes, and I'd let Steven Tyler, like all those dudes. All right. But so if Steven Tyler was going to sing which song? Would it be "Walk This Way" or would it be something else? Oh no! It would have to be "Dream On." Dream On. Okay. Every time I look. <laughs> I don't, I don't know though. He, I love his voice, but there's the baritone of like, okay, what if it was though like, she bring me love, Paul Rogers, I know it's all that I need, or Taj Mahal. Like, there's something in those baritones that like actually drops me to my knees. But no, okay, fuck yeah, I would let. All right, Mick Jagger. I'm just checking because I don't want because Mick's yes. watching, man. I don't want Come him to on, feel Mick. bad. I want Mick to voice fuck me really bad. All right. <laughs> Am I just being too rude? Have people hung up? I no, people are hanging up. no, not at all. They're calling their friends and telling them to tune in. Well, I'll tell you what. If people don't make this sexual and sensual, then they don't talk to me because the entire my entire career has been rooted in not having enough sex, yet making it all come alive through other people's music, but not touching them. So I don't touch him. And there you go. I touch my husband. This is my husband. He's cute. See, I'm not playing games like, oh, hello. <laughs>
he gets the benefit of all of my bizarre fantasies. So good for him. Yeah. So, shall we talk about another record? Sure. Should we talk about some Dixie Chicks? Yeah, I never recorded them, though, remember? I just mixed them. Yeah. So, were you getting a lot of just mixing gigs before that? That was during the era when I was getting a lot, when I started getting more mixing gigs than recording gigs, but it was like still kind of back and forth a little bit. Right. But that was definitely the era where people were starting to call me just to mix. That was around, I did that in Nashville. I don't know. Well, that record came out in 2003, so probably 2002, 2003, something like that. Oh yeah. So that was before I went to move to Nashville after the, that was, that was before Katrina. Yeah. But it was during the time when I was starting to like do more mixing, still working with Cheryl. She hooked me up with that because she produced that song. Oh, right. Then they met me and I think they gave me something else to do for them for some, you know, on their own. Right. I never met them. They didn't come to the studio. I remember digging how I got to make all three other vocals equally loud so that it was truly a, a triad or whatever you call it. A, a group vocal, but their timbres were so uniquely different and their presence f- functions, the functions of their presence in each of their voices. And so I actually found it really satisfying because the chick with the long hair, not Natalie Maines, um, she had long hair and uh, her voice was more like a cup that I could sit Natalie Maines is in, you know, but she could still be really loud and she was the middle note, I think. And um, generally the middle note, I don't even remember their names. I'm sorry, I, they were the Dixie Chicks and there were three of them. But I just remember that they fit into each other's vocal um, a lot, uh, allegiances really well. And once I figured out what that puzzle was, it was really fun to blend them. And there was no, you know, if the girl who was gonna be more featured in the second verse, was like, oh, I'm gonna need a little more of me. It never canceled out the other two. I never had to like, rethink the blend they all they were they were magnificently well tampered for each other their voices yeah yeah i i would Which is why they became a famous girl like the singing band <laughs> for instance yeah well so not too long after that waylon was born so this yeah. is obviously a big deal yeah it was it was a really big deal i was working on Sha- a shakira record when just briefly by the way when and i was in vancouver when i felt the quickening do you remember when your baby's quickened inside your wife's belly do well, you know she, do you remember, no. yeah yeah i mean she knows i you know but well yes. i didn't know what it was and i didn't even know it had a name but the minute that you know you're pregnant they told you you're pregnant you're getting fat you've seen like little ultrasound heartbeats but then there's a time when it, it kicks you and, or it moves and you're like, holy shit, that moved and it's inside me and I didn't make it move. Um, that's called the quickening. Anyway, that happened in a hotel room uh, on a brief um, Shakira thing that I did for a little bit in Vancouver while I was pregnant. But then that ended really badly and I flew home. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I was pregnant and uh, it was weird. And she's awesome, but the whole thing was, it was strange. You know, the whole, I have, I have very strange memories of it. You don't have to go into it. Yeah. So, well, I didn't even think it ever came out, anything I did. <clears throat> so were you sort of, once you knew you were pregnant and you knew that obviously there's going to be a lifestyle change, were you kind of pushing to move more into mixing or No. No, um, when I got, I, I, when I, first off, when I got pregnant, that was a surprise, a big surprise. So I was in denial for a lo- you know, a while, just thinking, well, obviously it's going to fall out, you know, or something's going to happen. It's not going to stay. Um, and then it did. And then the doctor even said, you have to stop calling yourself pregnant. I mean, you know, you're going to have a baby, you know, you're not just pregnant. Like this is going to have this end result. Um, I was in I was in a lot of turmoil because um, I had started working on Cheryl's Wildflowers record in Nashville, and um, I was pretty pregnant, and that you know that ended abruptly. So I I was kind of spinning. 
uh, into, I think my career is gonna be over. I actually don't think that the uh, world, the universe is gonna allow me to have a baby and a career. And I was also scared of being pregnant because I, I didn't embrace it like, ah, pregnancy. I was just like, fuck, what the fuck? But there was never any question that I was having a baby to me. I mean, I love, I believe in choice, but in this, in this instance, I was like, well, I'm having a baby. I mean, I was 38 going on 39. I was like, what the hell, you know? So <clears throat> I was real scared, you know, and I, I was doing some mixing, but not a lot at home. Mostly it was in studios. So I was mixing and, um, but it wasn't a ton. I was getting better and better at it. But I mostly thought this baby's going to come. And when it does, this is going to be over. And you're going to be alone with a baby and no job. <laughs> so, you know, I was, I was worried about, it. I wasn't sure that my, who's, you know, my partner now that we were going to make it, you know, that we were going to stick it out. And it was awful. It was actually awful. I didn't think I did what I could and I just tried to survive. And then, you know, Cheryl didn't want me to finish that record because of the pregnancy. And so I just felt like, wow, my shit's over after all this time. And then this go back go a little bit to, the Sylvia Massey telling you like you got to make a choice yeah. between that. Were you thinking about that at the time? Like you, well, I was thinking about it in so far as I wish I was Sylvia Massey and not me because Sylvia Massey at least owns a Neve board. So she got pregnant and then didn't get any work anymore. She could still have her Neve board and she has income and I was too stupid to buy a Neve board. So I made all the wrong turns. And I didn't build an architecture to motor myself forward and my mighty talent forward. I just stayed buried in the studio doing it, but not surrounding it with the things I needed to, to get me through something like this. So I just figured I'm going to have a baby and I guess I'm done. <laughs> well, fortunately had... you weren't done. No, no. Then Peter Collins, my friend, when I was like seven months pregnant, so then I was really pregnant and fat. Um, he had me come in to mix a record for a girl named uh, uh, Courtney J. Courtney J, I believe her name was. She's lovely. And um, I might even track that. I don't remember. But um, and so Peter was as lovely as awesome. He's a, a British producer who I adore. So that made me feel good again. And, uh, and then after that, it was time to just, you know, get home and, and figure out how to get this baby out of me. And then I had the baby and then I got a couple gigs and I realized I could bring him in the turtle back and just stick them under the console. <laughs> and it was fine. I just keep the volume low. And then when he got a little bigger, I could set up the vocal booth as a ISO for the baby with a microphone boom there and his own meter and everything. But then when he got mobile, it was, then it got really different. <laughs> you know, it was the only thing now, if a woman wants to know if there's any women out there and you want to know, was it hard being a woman in the studio? No, it was fun. Was it hard being a woman in the studio? Yes, when I had a baby and I wanted to be with my baby. Oh, by the way, once he came out, I loved him. I, I didn't like being pregnant, but once he was there, I was like, oh, hell yeah, that, that thing is mine. If I'm going <laughs> to the studio, he's with me. And plus he's feeding off of my boobs. So I have to bring him everywhere. And, um, and I have to feed him, breastfeed him because I dig it and it's awesome, but also it'll make me lose weight and get rid of you know this extra 60 pounds. And, uh, so, but having the baby, wanting to be with my baby and not wanting to put up with other people's needs was a challenge. I need my amp sound. And I thought I need to go milk my tits. <laughs> so we got differing needs at this moment that made it real hard, but then it got easy. Now it's super easy because he's 16 and he drives. He doesn't need me much anymore. And I'm reverting right back to my old self. <laughs> Lock, stock and barrel. And it only took 16 years. Well, it'll take until he goes away to college, really, because I still have to like, I mean, and I want to, I still, he's still a minor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I still have to get him to school. No, I adore my son. He's everything. So when you went back to Henson A&M to do records, did you ever feel like reminding them of when they said, yeah, we don't hire women? Yes, except for not a single person who worked there then worked there. Not, in other words, now right. it was Hanson and, and it was owned by 
Henson or whoever owns right. it. Um, but even at the end of the A and M days, I mean, like Jamie Sikora has been there for years and years, and yeah. Like, no, and you know still. what? I did some stuff with Cheryl, but it was still A and M. As a matter of fact, when I come to think of it, it turned into Henson during that era of between 1994 and 2003, mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah, it was somewhere then, in there. I mean, because Jimmy took I mean, I even right. had it for just long enough to take all the gear out and then got rid of it, right? <laughs> I'd give one of the microphones to Cheryl. Um, but, well, he was around, you know, and I, I feared him greatly. Um, so I stayed away from him. He, by the way, he's going to, I'll probably get like smote some way for saying this, <laughs> but he struck me as one of those dudes that had a, not a dominant personality naturally, but had given the dominance mantle by, by nature of being a male and then being in this industry that honored male dominance. Um, and probably used it inappropriately sometimes. It wasn't the most balanced of the wearers. Um, but boy, did he have instincts that were correct. He, he, exa he I, I saw examples of it twice. And I was like, dude's fucking right. And the funny thing is the reason I thought he was right is I had already thought that, <laughs> but I wouldn't have ever been able to say it. And then he said it and I thought that's exactly what the fuck I was thinking. I'm not kidding, but I didn't, but again, if that doesn't mean I, you know, he took that from me. It means, ah, that I thought that same truth. That is the truth. That is what she needs to do. And yet he, he gets to say it. He has the privilege of saying it and he's wearing the crown. I won't get me a crown. I never did. What I did was I backed away from all of that. And I did get a crown with people who trust me. And want me to wear it and are like tell us what you think will serve our song not look at me please i have to compete 24 7. i have a competitive idea that might make me competitive so therefore let me offer it at the risk of the whole room you know snarling at me so yeah i don't fuck around with that anymore right all right look we can finally get you to nashville through the devastation that was Katrina. Yeah. Because that wasn't like, oh, yeah, there's some severe weather where I live. Maybe I shouldn't live here anymore. I mean, you got wiped out, right? Yeah. Yeah, my house got, um, basically, it was a, I had my baby. I had a, I had a beautiful Victorian in the Bywater. Gorgeous, 15-foot ceilings. Wonderful, wonderful, beautiful, old, falling apart house. And then I had the baby and... Uh, you know, the baby was little <laughs> as babies are, you know, even down to man, I'm having trouble heating and cooling, you know, the plaster's falling in. Like one day I walked in, I was like, there's plaster dust in my baby's little crib. I, you know, I can't, ah, uh, you know, I was going crazy. So I found a different house and I, I sold that house and I moved into this, um, almost like a, like a New England bungalow in this area called the, uh, um, Gentilly and um, on Gentilly Ridge and it had a little converted attic and it was just this much smaller house. Anyway, that fucking thing got eight feet of water and it sat in there for three weeks. Wow. And so everything was ruined except what was upstairs in my little converted attic, which had a baby nursery and an extra bedroom and an office, um, which everything got covered in black mold. So I got a few things out, you know, metal things, things that could my Grammys. I think I already told you that. That were the actual ones were destroyed, but I sent them back to the Grammy man in Colorado and he restored them for me. Because um, they don't give you new ones if your shit gets wrecked. Wow. Just so you know, if you guys lose your Grammys in a catastrophic flood, they do not replace them. You have to buy them and they're like 700 bucks a piece. And you don't even own them anyway because they're owned by Neris. Right. They could take them away. So anyway, he fixed my shit up. That was catastrophic. I lost everything. Yeah. So you decided to move. Mm -hmm. We went up to Nashville. I was actually going up to Nashville to work. We were living at actually exactly where we are right now, but all this wasn't built. It was just my mother-in-law's little bitty house here in Fairhope, Grace's mom. And, you know, we were here and it was crowded and the, the baby. And so I was going up to Nashville to work on James Otto's mix. I love that man. And, um, so I was driving around and I saw this barn for sale. And uh, 
So even though I lost my house in Katrina and I lost all my gear and took a huge capital loss and lost equity and got shit from my insurance and a terrible adjuster who got stuck with who you got stuck with and you had to accept what FEMA was going to give you for your house. Anyway, whatever. I had made a profit on my Victorian. So I had a little money stashed away. I was not completely, I didn't lose all my equity in my house. So we were able to get into, I was like, man, Grace, you want to move to Nashville? We could live in a barn for a little while and get the fuck out of Dodge and go heal. And so we did. We moved up there for five years. Right. But you were in Fairhope af right after Katrina until you moved to Nashville? Yeah, but there wasn't that long of a time. It was about seven or eight months. Right, right. Yeah. And all that was spent dealing with like FEMA and, you know, um, uh, 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 sorry, the, uh, the, the flood, the national flood insurance. Right. Um, I, I mean, it, it was those seven months went by like a wash because I was having to deal with a, a, a completely destroyed life. It's just city's gone. You know, your shit is gone. Everybody, you know, is flown to the, you know, it was those seven months might as well have been a week as far as how, like, certainly wasn't like working. Although I did go out and mix the Queens of the stone age surround sound live thing during the, the height of that kept you know that maelstrom that was fun and that must have been a good little getaway then it was fantastic and we worked at that cool studio um glenwood studio is that is there a place in yeah LA glenwood called? glenwood place in burbank yeah yeah it was beautiful oh and you know what while i was out there mixing um the pointer sisters were working in another room and i didn't really get to meet them except that that a little bit because I had my baby and a nanny and then my nanny and the baby were out in like the courtyard and the pointer sisters were sitting at a table eating. And then my nanny was taught, they were like, you know, Oh, the baby, the baby. And so I ran out there and I was like, Oh my fucking God, the pointer sisters are talking to my baby. <laughs> it was very cool. <laughs> now, very cool. What's your favorite pointer sisters song? Would you say? Oh, well shit. Now I'm, now I'm right. Well, I don't, the, don't mean to put you on the spot. It's only because I love to, for the people who don't know, were you a Sesame street fan? Oh yes. You know the really fucking cool pinball machine song? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That's the Pointer Sisters. No kidding. No kidding. Hang on. I'll give you the right answer to my favorite point. Because right now all that's coming to mind is uh Staple Singers, which is obviously not the Pointer Sisters. But it's because I have I have a certain amount of uh brain death that has happened over time. So hang on a second. I'm Googling it. Slow hand, I love the shit out of that song. You know, fire. I just love the Pointer Sisters. Um, see now that a lot of their, I'm going back here. Slow hand probably would be my favorite one. Then I'm gonna say slow hand, and not like I'm faking it. I wanna love her with a slow hand. I know exactly what song I'm talking. Now, would about. you take that into your mouth? Yes, any one of those women could sing right into my mouth. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And better yet, all three of them. That's Get only, right up in there. That's only legal in some states. <laughs> that's, yeah. Mavis Staples. Yes. I mean, who, I don't think these women were, or men, maybe, especially the old men. Oh, Christopherson, even though he doesn't have a voice that I want to have fuck me. Sorry, Chris. He's got <laughs> everything else. He can, he can voice fuck me in a minute. All right. Yes. All right. So, and these men aren't going to want to do this, but some of the old the ones that are now old, like me, that you, you know, that when they were young, that's what they're thinking about. That's what I'm thinking about. They might still want to. I would never even court a young man, a young voice. No. You have to be in my, in my peer group. Yeah. I'm not going to do that to some young dude. That'd be disgusting. All right. Interesting. Interesting. You know, where you because draw the I'm line. 56. You know, that'd be like, they'd be like voice fucking their mama or their grandma, some of them. And plus, I'm not I'm not deeply, intensely turned on by any super young men voices because they weren't part of my coming of age. So I'm really only attached to the ones I already loved. Right. I'm not saying they're not great. No, no, no. But, no, no, no. Fair you know, enough. I am what I am. I'm a, I'm a product of my coming of age. Look, you can only want to be voice fucked by the people you want to be voice fucked by. Exactly. And mine, are, mine is a pretty set list. Yeah. Although I have just added Christopherson on. He would have been on anyway if he'd ever emailed and said, can I get on that list? <laughs> yes. Now, all right. What about Daryl Hall? No. Well, have you heard 
not the Hall and Oates stuff. He's but... a brilliant singer. I adore his voice. Yeah. And I think that he is a, a, a vocalist skilled beyond measure, but he doesn't but have the, the timbre. It's we're talking about a timbre here. I'm okay. not talking about anything other than an actual sonic component. All right, it's got to be all of these then. people's voices. Yeah. That actually vibrate my chest and my groin and my thighs and the back of my head and my armpits and my fingers like they their bodies their voices move my body and i i don't know why they do it they do though i physically move it that's why i do this for a living all right enough with the voice fucking for right now well i'm sure Let's we're gonna come back that. to it we're gonna get back to it in a couple of seconds but i want to know so was nashville just sort of by default because you'd been doing some work up there and you saw this barn it's not like you were because you had to have been thinking about well where are we gonna go yeah. right or had you not even and, gotten to that point yet because you're still dealing with all the fallout well i was still dealing with all the fallout but i was getting gigs at nashville um my my friend uh, james otto of course i had I had gotten, I mean, people were, I was getting pity gigs too, like, oh, you know, the New Orleans musicians, I, you know, people that have lost everything. And I was getting some pity gigs. It felt like pity. I mean, I was good, but it still felt like they were tossing in my way to try to hook me up. And I was grateful for it. And a couple of those came out of Nashville. And one of them was uh, just a movie soundtrack mix for this guy named James Otto. So I went up there, you know, drove myself up. It wasn't like, we'll fly you up. I drove up, got to work at Blackbird in the, on their, killer neve and um and i mixed this movie soundtrack thing you know drove back home and two days later whatever I, and uh i had never even met james and um and then about a month or two later james otto called me out of the blue and he's like yeah you're the woman who mixed that movie soundtrack he's got a real low voice it's real sexy um you know well i gotta tell you i got a record coming out and i love the way that movie soundtrack track sounds. I love all that bass and I want you to remix my whole record. It's already done. My producer doesn't know this yet, but I keep listening to my record and then I keep listening to the song you did for this movie and I want my stuff to sound like that. So the label flew me up and stuck me in a studio and and that is, it was during that mix that I saw, found the barn. And I felt like, you know, after that, it was well received and it, you know it had a number one song on it not that i had like points it wasn't any like that i was just day rate but that went well and right away some other work you know kind of following on that i got a little scent around me people come sniffing around after a little while but then i flew in the face of conformity as i often do and nashville rejected me flat out i mean they gave me my walking papers so is this something specific yeah basically I was going to continue to mix exactly the way that I hear and conform to the artist's needs. I mean, but you, if people are coming to me, they want something about the way I make stuff sound. Yeah. James Otto certainly did. <clears throat> well, there was some kickback on that, that record about, you know, not having the vocal out so fucking loud that it, that it hurts and using a verb here and there, or whatever, just doing the thing, just making it cool. And that record went over really good. But James has a big voice. He's a big man. But then I got some more coming my way and I was just doing my same old thing. And they're like, no, 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 no. We need this is you know, too dark. We need a lot less space. We need this and that. I was like, y'all just make it me into what you already have. What You already have people that mix this way. So I'm going to keep mixing the way that I mix. And because I can't hear it this other way. It doesn't, this is not fun for me. So if you're going to make me be like whatever you could get anyway, I'm not going to do it. So I'm not going to do it. And the next time you come in here and touch my fucking mix without my permission, this game is over. And then the guy looked at me and said, this game's over right now. He was the head of A&R or something from the label. <laughs> and I still thought, I don't give a shit. I have spent 11 hours on that console and you're not an engineer or you think you are, but you're not. You don't do this for a living. And you come in here and you have the assistant fire and you move around my mix it doesn't matter if you're paying for it. This is wait, my wait. Mix he right had now. someone else come in and was changing the mix on the no, board without you before, there. Yeah, before I got there, the second engineer fired, you know, turned everything on, loaded the mix for him, the one that he had a problem with. And he sat down on the board and proceeded to mess around with my shit before I got there. And when I got there and he was there, the artist was there. And they're like, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I just wanted to, you know, kind of see what you're doing. 
Yeah, because he's a little worried about certain amounts of bass or whatever it was. And I was just like, well, you could hear what I'm doing. And what the fuck are you doing, man? You want to mix it, mix it. He didn't like my attitude, so he fired me. And then I was like, you know, I don't like any of y'all's attitude. And I don't even like country music. So fuck you people. See ya. <laughs> and well, that was what it needed to be. I'm not going to pretend. No. Yeah. So wait, so how long had you been in Nashville when this happened? Not long. Then. Oh, two or three years oh, okay. at that point. Yeah. But I was also, it wasn't like I was getting all these country records right away or any country records. I was still doing the shit that I normally do, but in Nashville. But when the James Otto record came out, you know, say by the next year, the James Otto record's right. out, it's sounding great. It's got a number one song. You know, within that next year, I start getting more work of that genre it's going good. I'm getting some kickback. They're wanting certain things that I'm not interested in doing and also not wanting to pay. They're wanting to, they keep, you keep hearing, Oh, well, will you do it for 400 a day? No, I will not. You know, we do it for seven. No, I will do it for what my rate was then. I don't even remember, but whatever it was now I'm hourly. I, I went to hourly pretty quickly, but anyway, and so that maybe by that next year, I started to feel like you people keep calling and you want something that I don't want to give you because it makes it unenjoyable for me and I'd rather not have your money, even though I'd rather, even though I'm going to go broke if I don't take this money and do this. I just, if I'm going to prostitute myself, I'm going to do it for something else other than that. Not for some asshole A&R man who walks into the room and dares touch those faders of my fucking mix. You want to mix the song, you wait for me to show up, you look at me and say, you are finished. You'll be paid out for what you've done. I will now be mixing this record. I'm not going to sit behind him and teach him how to mix my song. Yeah. The song, right? At that moment, it is my song. Whatever. I was territorial as hell. I still am. Not, not to the artist. The artist could nuzzle right up to me and say, look, will you show me what you're doing to the bass? Can we? But this good no dude was a prick. Right. Obviously, right off the bat. You know, and he had a flat ass and stupid jeans. Not <laughs> sexy. Unattractive. <laughs> can't even tap his foot in time anyway i'm not going there no 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 don't go there don't go All there right. but look while you were and, while you know, and i'm a sexist pig if he had been hot and i'd have liked him even a little bit i probably would have put up with a little more shit than i did so right yeah i'm just as sexist as the next guy fine it's fine but look while you were there you did work on a couple other things like uh, nancy stuff. griffith yes loved it anything in particular about that because she drank a lot. <laughs> All right. That was a drag. You know, that got in the way of a lot of stuff, but she was just delightful, frolicking, lovely, an exquisite voice, so tuneful. And, you know, she had like butterfly voice. Like her voice was like made of a pile of giant monarch wings. It was very <laughs> soft, but you know what I mean? It, it had a, a very engaging way about it. And she was friendly. She loved me. She was kind. But the drinking got in front of a lot of stuff. So I have to tell you the truth. That made it hard. Right. But I did that. I mixed that. Did I track that or just mix that? I think I just mixed that. I don't know. I don't know either. I think I tracked some stuff and then I mixed it for Peter Collins. Really, what happened in Nashville is the Nashville people didn't want me around, but Peter Collins, who lived in Nashville, did want me around. And he did wonderful stuff. And he did Nancy Griffith. So everything else in Nashville that wasn't coming in from old sources was usually coming from Peter Collins, who I adore to this day. And, and Peter had to struggle. And he'd, he'd worked with Nancy before with the, um, you know, the, the, the drinking. And it was hurting him. It was hurting the record. It was hurting me. But all in all, I think the record is beautiful. Um, she was very open about her alcoholism, so I don't feel weird saying it. It was a hard mm. record for her to make. I heard her say that about that record, too. She knows that. Right. I think she got sober after, a, a, more sober after that. Right. I'm trying to, because part of me feels like, after talking to you about all this, that you love being in the room to record, but then you've also got this sense of wanting to be left alone with it, which is, of course, the definition of mixing. Yes. But... I mean, when you're just mixing stuff that other people have recorded, are you very often like wishing you'd tracked it because like it's not where you want to start or you just don't care? It's... Don't care. I, I make it brand new again for me. Um, and I 
I, I can, if, I, if I'm engaged enough, like I've told you before, I will just start up a narrative. Uh, I may very well put myself in the room that I did record it, but not the, not the narrative isn't the act of recording it. It would be a storyline that is following the act of recording it. Um, that makes me bond with it. I attach it to all kinds of stuff. When I am in the room with the artist and I'm recording live, I love that. But again, the artists are usually my friends now. I don't, strangers, you know, in other words, when I'm in there, if I'm going to go in there, it's usually people I already know and love, so very comfortable. Yet still, what I love is when they're out there and I'm in here, well, this being my control, like being alone in the room with the sound that's coming out, the speakers of their performance, not actually being with them in the, like, in right. the best picture, they just stay in the tracking room and not come, <laughs> and not come in and mess up the control room. No, um, you know, it's still the it's still a connection though with the with the output of their bodies, not their presence that is enth as enthralling to me. Um, I'm still a loner, you know. It is still even when they all you know clamber in and and, and populate behind, I'm still in my very set little spot with all my shit right where it needs to be. I'm not walking around the room. I'm right where I need to be. And I'm only engaged with the speakers. You know, I, I'm not, they're there and I hear them and they're my, I adore them. They're my friends, but I'm still only engaging as if they weren't. Right. So the recording of the moment is as good as the moment itself. Yes. Better because the moment itself, I think only, that's why the mouth fucking thing comes into play, by the way, for the moments that could be the biggest vocal capturings of my life being in the room while they do it live would not be it, it, it would be gone i'll get to feel it but then it would be gone but the moment that it is captured and then it's going to come out of the speakers that is the moment for me right i mean that it got captured you know and it passed through me it's already in me it actually passed through my body you know pass out of the board into the tape machine back out of the tape machine back through me through the console off the speaker so it went through me one way or the other and therefore i'm part of it right i'm part of the moment forever and i'm attached to that voice in that moment forever and the closest if i wasn't recording it the only other way i could get that close is if yeah they, they'd have to sing it into me right and so when you're mixing the stories are what put you in the moment even if you weren't there yeah you just create again, you the moment yeah, in your head. I just create the moment. I create the very, if I'm in, if I like the idea of the studio that I think they, tra or that I know they tracked it in, you know, stories can take place in that studio, but I move it off site pretty regularly. Right. All right. So there are two other projects, which I believe were both Nashville things, which have nothing to do with each other, but they're just interesting in terms of the discography to me. One is Murder by Death and the other is Faith Hill. Which one do you want to start what with? What did I do? What the fuck did I do for Faith Hill? I don't know. It's 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 on the internet. You know, maybe you didn't. So we could Does just talk about Murder song? by Death instead. I don't know. I can look it up if you want. Here, I'll I'll look well, it up I while mean, you talk about Murder I by Death. I suppose she yeah, Murder by Death was just fantastic. Um, Adam is the singer, and oh, the incredible uh, cello player. Her name has slipped out of my mind just for a second. Um, it'll come back to me. Those were fantastic records. Those were fun. Those were productions. I produced, recorded, and mixed those. So I was able to really like just jump in all the way um, and just, you know, Red of Tooth and Claw. The guy was such a weird, awesome, unique musician and everything about him was just fun and engaging and beautiful. I love those records. I'll just try to think of, you know, getting the cello together was really difficult. The cello was its own whole vocal. So the cello had to be comped for its expressiveness and content as much as the entire lead vocals. You know, and his songs were very uh, story-like anyway. You know, they were, they were, they were big movements and, and, and sections and very interesting way that he wrote songs. He had a good, rich baritone. I like that baritone on him. And, um, and you know, there wasn't a lot of money, so he had to work fast. 
I got to remember some stuff about Red and Tooth and Claw. I'm going to Google it a little bit while you tell me what I did up to Faith Hill. What well, I do to her. Supposedly, you mix something on Country Love. But maybe it was, you know what? It's got a lot of different people on this. So I'll bet it was somebody else. Because there's Big and I, Rich. Oh, it's a James Otto track. That's what it is. Oh, okay. Okay, then forget it, was, it. Yeah. Forget uh, maybe it. she's. She sang on it or so. Oh no, no, she, no, no. I think it's right, a compilation right. of love songs from country love songs. Oh, how funny! It always goes to the movie "Murder by Death." I loved that movie. Didn't you love that movie? Yes, that's a great movie. Um, now there, interestingly, there are two other mixers listed on that record. The uh, the Murder by Death record. Oh, I'm sure that they they may. You know what? Maybe I didn't. Hang oh, on a second. Mike, I gotta well, you're listed for mixing, but Mike Paragon, who we talked about, yeah, um, and uh, and William Sender. Oh no, those were my. They, those were the engineers of the house, and I put them on. I wanted them right. on the mix line with me. They nice. did a lot. That's when I started sharing credits. Yeah, Sarah was her name. Yeah. It was freaking me out that I couldn't Sarah Ballet. Her name. or ballet or. Um. <laughs> This is stupid, but I remember her. I always have dry skin on my hands, and she brought me in some Aveda hand relief cream. But then she made a new label for it that said "sweet, sweet hand relief," and we <laughs> thought it was really funny. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know, just stupid shit like that, you know, that cracked me up. And we worked at Dark Horse, didn't we? Yes, I swear we cut that at Dark Horse, and I mixed it at East Iris. But I gotta remember, I did Red of Tooth and Claw. I remember that. What else did I do? Didn't I do two of those? Uh, I think so. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's find out. Let's find out what the internet says, anyway. Good morning, Magpie. Yeah. Good I can morning, swear Magpie. I did both of those in yeah. 2010. Yeah. Oh, now, now a lot of that, a little bit of that, got caught up in uh, uh, the. I was moving to during that time, moving back to Fairhope. So that was kind of more towards the end of my Nashville era. But I love them. Um, you know what was weird? Out of the blue, um, I must have got a licensing payment. They must have got a licensing because many, many years later, you know, you get a check for $6,000. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> How, well? I mean, I, I, I didn't even know it ever recouped. I didn't think it did. I never got any residuals. And then I got a a licensing this was several years ago but still it was way later yeah that's when i thought oh sometimes those old points you got kicking around here and well there. it's some automobile ad in japan or something and they would have been thrilled because we were you know of course way you know it was very limited budget all of us myself included took you know we're like we want to do this we want to do this let's we want more studio time in other words i always wanted more studio time than more money in my pocket because i'd have more money but then i'd be more stressed out so i didn't have enough time to do it right so you know, we all wanted to get as much time in the rooms as we could. So everybody was working. We were like making our own sandwiches for food and really. And so they would be glad to know that because they would obviously got money too. So all these years later, a little bit, if you hang on to your masters, get a little money. Nice. Or it's that it finally recouped and now you got paid back to record one. No, I could tell this was a licensing thing. Right. You know, because this came with the little, the little, because they're on the label. I think it's Van, um, not Vanguard. Uh, uh i'll tell you in a sec something um they were on a i thought they were on a label whoa hold on a second is that right since good morning magpie did you just mix that one because it said it was tracked at electrical in chicago so is that you know what i might not even have worked on that one or maybe i mixed it i cannot remember it's very hard for me to remember my own career well, until the song Let's vagrant is the label uh Yeah, and Farm Fresh Studios. Weird. Um, so some tracking at Electrical, but it doesn't look like Steve was involved. So yeah, they must have just booked the room or who knows. I don't This is so a personnel. Let me just look. You know what? They might have just sent that to me to do some mixes. I think they tracked it themselves. Right. So they might have just gone in at Electrical and... Yes, and then sent engineer. me tracks. Yeah. I definitely mixed this record though, because I'm I, I'm looking at the title now, or hang on, track listing. Let me just. There's nowhere to find credits, but I swear to God, I did, and I think they they recorded it by themselves. They were real proud of that fact, 
And I think that, um, well, you're the only listed mixer. So yeah, that's what happened. They, yeah. they got real proud of them. They made their own because during the one, um, murder by death, I remember that as being now that I think about it, an empowering session of me showing them stuff and being like, cause they were interested in recording. Adam was really into it, you know, like he wanted to understand how the stuff worked. So, you know, teaching them and showing them and how to get sounds, whatever. And so I think they took a little bit and added obviously to that knowledge and recorded their own tracks. And then I mixed it and it, it was great. I remember that that is what happened. Right. Sorry, I don't remember. Better. No, no, no. So this is part of the uh, same time as you're moving back to Mobile. Yeah. I mean, Fairhope. But mm -hmm. so and you just had enough in Nashville because you like the Nashville work itself was not the work you wanted anyway, or? Well, it turned out that, you know, my husband's six, like what, you know, the success that he has had in his career is um, supported by regional success down here. In other words, New Orleans, but like this whole, the Gulf Coast realm is where he gets a lot of his gigs and is able to pick up money. And um, so he was feeling pretty isolated up there in, in terms of he was having to drive down, just back down here for most of his, right. of his gigs. I was missing my friends. I had friends in Nashville, very good friends and that are still my friends, but yeah, I was lonely for the Gulf Coast. He was lonely for the Gulf Coast. We were missing New Orleans, Nashville. You know, I, I, I was getting some work. It was going pretty good. But then 2008 was the recession. Mm -hmm. And people in the mid-level mid music industry took a big hit in terms of pay. Um, a lot of people started to suffer. Um, I don't know that if you remember how significant that was. Oh, but God, yes. Yeah. So, you know, what was labels paying, you know, 1500 bucks a track to mix plus the room fee and all that, it just went away, you know, and then suddenly people and people were starting to mix at home. You know, Jakir King was one of the huge influencers in me realizing I'm going to need to start mixing at home because record budgets shrank. Um, I had lost all my stuff in Katrina, but I had rebought Pro Tools, you know, and I had my little wonky rig at home for editing mostly. But then, you know, people be like, look, we got 10 grand to mix the record, but that's got to pay for the room. Well, the room's going to be 6,000 and, you know, 4,000 for the site. Like, in other words, it was starting to not yeah. make sense. And uh, so I just started buying stuff and setting it up at home because Jakir King was doing that. You know, he was very famous in the, you know, in, the, in the world of recording at that time and doing really great stuff. And so he kind of inspired me that I could do that. And so was Chad Blake. You know, Chad was kind of setting up at heaven. So I started to yeah. veer towards figuring out how to do demo mixes for people and at least do some of the stuff at home. And, and, and then that's when I discovered with very little gear, I could do this. I just, I'm going to need, you know, I mean, I'm still surrounded by almost a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment and even in my stupid little room, but it adds up including all the instruments and cabling, but you know, you had to make that investment and then just, and then everybody started setting up at home, you know? And yeah. so now, you know, I obviously only want to track in a magnificent room. I'm not going to track in some shitty little thing. But mixing, I won't mix anywhere but right here because this is where I hear, you know, this is where I could really understand what, what I'm doing. But what was your question? I don't know, whatever, about All moving, right. about like moving back there. Yeah, so, well, it also, we were ended up a little bit over mortgaged and it didn't feel good to me anymore. I was like, I've never lived where my mortgage payment has had to be a struggle. And it started to feel like a struggle and it just started to end nanny. In order to work, because we were 40 minutes south of Nashville, in order to work, my baby was three then, four, you know, I had to have a nanny and the nanny was running $28,000 a year. Well, if you're only making, I mean, I'm proud. I don't, I don't care what the world knows. I like, I never maxed out bigger than like 100, 120,000 a year. Those were my fattest of all years. Well, then it slips down to like 80 to 70,000 a year. Then you watch it plummet down to 40,000 a year. And it's like, you know, this sucks. And then it might jerk back up, but yeah. the whole thing came down under a hundred thousand a year. And I was struggling to make 
hardly enough to keep up what was, you know, had turned into an expensive life. And I needed the nanny all the time. Grayson was gone on all the weekends down here trying to keep things alive. Nothing was making sense anymore. So we sold the barn during that terrible time. And I still made my money back and came down here. And I was like, I could build a badass mix room. We could build onto your mom's house because that already belonged to Grace and he's an only child and she wasn't living in it. So just, you know, let's just put all our money right here, build it up. And we did and, and, and great. And then the world changed in tandem where everybody was just sending people drives, yeah. you know, for mixing and, and that all happened during those next five years where it became the norm. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the PV brothers because they're a big part of this, right? Because the local studio, I mean, you've said that you don't always track there, that you've got some bigger studios a little further away that you, you like to track, but Dolphin Street Productions is... Dolphin Street Sound. Dolphin Street Sound. This is what happened. I'll tell you exactly right. what happened. I would start by saying to the camera, to the, the PV Brothers are my salvation. I adore you boys. If you ever see this, I love them. They have become, you know, Luke, I see a lot more than Jake, but so integral to my very being and my life and my love and my structure of existence. And I, I to them to a smaller degree, but we, uh, we love each other. We are family. And now that studio and the, those young men in it that were just boys when I came around and they started wanting to build that place. Now they have, they're coming into their own and you know how they're doing it through blue, who's a mobile rapper who has gotten very famous, very quickly, very wealthy, very quickly. Drake is on him. And now those boys all are on platinum records as the engineers. And I told them, you guys just got to stick it out. You do not know where your break will come, but it will come because you're so dedicated. Anyway, that's long story short. I couldn't get into that mobile studio now. If I would, I'd have to wait. It was so booked. <laughs> and it happened for him and I knew that it would. So several years ago, around 2015, 14, 15 in that time, my career was shit. There was nothing going on. I wasn't getting any calls. Now, mind you, I don't promote myself. And I failed badly. I have a magnificent talent. I'm okay to say that because I know what it is. That doesn't make me great. I'm looking at the camera. I'm looking at your peeps right now. <laughs> but I did not create an architecture to motor myself and my talent forward. A person like Dave Cobb did also magnificently talented, but he built a machine because he's a brilliant businessman underneath to motor him along, to like, to, to, to usher forth his talent. And that is why he is the king. I made no such thing. I didn't even make a little go-kart. I made nothing. I don't even have something with wooden wheels. I don't even have like a pushy thing on the railroad tracks <laughs> that you pump yourself. I didn't do shit. A pushy thing, don't. is that what they're called? Yeah, I'm not even on the, on the fucking Facebook or Instagram. So I did nothing because I'm lazy and I don't like it. And I regret it because I'd be a rich woman right now, but I don't really regret it because it's not who I am. Anyway, the machine. So I had never built that machine. And even though I am, in my opinion, the best mixer out there, better than all those dudes, but no machine. No studio, nothing. And I don't play instruments. I just sing really good to tell people what they ought to do. So um, it was collapsing. I was literally signing up for college. I took trig. I took pre-cal, all this stuff. I was just going to go and get a degree in electrical engineering and call it a day. Fuck it. I can't do it. I work at Target. It was tanking. And I didn't know how to blow life back into it. I didn't know what to do. So out of the blue... Do we have time to tell the story like it really went down? Yeah, you've got all the time in the world. And do people care? Do y'all want to hear? I, will, this I care. And you're, I'm the only okay, one. Okay. And I'm talking to you. Yeah, exactly. So this friend of mine who I didn't know very well at all, Ben Jernigan, was just a person that I knew in passing, who actually I knew as a paramedic and like a local mobile guitar player. He basically calls me out of the blue and then says, look, I got to come over to Fairhope and talk to you in person. Okay, Ben, why? He shows up and he's like, I've been hanging out with, uh, you know, Jake Peavy. And I immediately think, the, like, did he, does he own PV amps? Is he like a amp owner? <laughs> he's like, no, 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 no. And Ben was like kind of 
Ben, I adore Ben, but Ben was a little bit of kind of like a, a shit shooter, you know, and I, no, no, he's, he's stinky, he's filthy rich. Cool. I know a lot of filthy rich people. What do you want? He's like, no, he's a ball player, man. He's a fucking famous ball player. Anyway, he wants to build a studio in Mobile and like, we're going to hook him up and all this shit. And I thought he was talking a load of shit. And if we want to know, yeah, we want you to tell us like what to do to get the studio built. And all this. And I was like, well, I'm in the middle of a mix. I did have the occasional job. And um, I said, so you pay me a thousand dollars and I'll come across the bay and tell your rich friend what he should do to build a studio. Cause I thought it sounded like bullshit. And so I go over there I, and I told him a thousand dollars cash, which Ben actually, I got over there, handed me. And I was like, okay, in a paper bag money. before you got this out of the drug car. Money. These right? people are drug weirdos. Anyway, I had no idea who Jake Peavy was. I had no idea. I don't watch baseball. I don't know anything about baseball. I don't know anything about Mobile, even though I live across the Bay. And they're looking at this building on, on Dauphin Street that used to have this shitty old studio in it called Jada, which I did know a little bit about, but it was like some demo rap. It was just garbage, right? Sorry, Jada owners, but you know, it wasn't anything I was gonna work at. So anyway, you know, Ben's there and it's all like all these people around and I walk in the control room and I was like, well, you're not gonna keep any of this shit, I hope. I mean, is this what you brought me down here to talk about this? Like, what am I doing here? What do you want? And then Jake rolls in and uh, again, I had no idea who he was, you know, shook hands. Hi, nice to meet you. And I was like, well, it's nice to meet you. Do you play for the Alabama team? <laughs> and he's like, no, ma'am, there is no Alabama team. I was like, oh, what do you play for? He's like, you know, the San Diego Padres or whatever it was. And <laughs> I was like, oh, that's cool. You play baseball for long. <laughs> he's, I'm just making conversation. He's cute as hell. And he's like, hey, you know, I've been playing for a while. I used to play for the you know, Chicago Cubs or whatever, like whoever else, the New York Yankees or white dogs, <laughs> them guys that he got the, the, what he would, the World Series for. And <laughs> then he got it again. And so I'm not realizing that he's at that moment in his life, that one of the most famous baseball players and one of the wealthiest baseball players. So I'm just still thinking, <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking. You know, I thought, what do you people want? And I said, I looked at him. He retells this story better because I only saw it from my point of view. I looked at him and I said to him, you want to play with me? You want, you want a studio in here? You better get me a console and not that one because I'm more sexually attracted to consoles than I am to most people, including yourself and all you guys. Like, stop, but whatever this is, you want me to come around here, you better put some money where your mouth is. You better go buy the gear that I want to be near, that I want to rub on. And uh, then Jake said, fine, you make me a list of what you want, what you are attracted to, girl. <laughs> and uh, I was like, all right. And I did. And I went back and I made the list of an API board, all this shit. Uh, but what I really wanted, though, I wasn't jerking around. I thought, because I thought, you know, it's one thing to be really wealthy and just think, oh, I'm going to roll into town. And I didn't even realize he's from Mobile. Like, he's a local boy. He is a god. That man is a phoenix. But I didn't know what he was then. I thought that he might just be a rich asshole ball player who wanted to dabble around in music because he could and was going to disrespect the people like me and all my friends who bled for it and still didn't have shit, you know, and worked so hard and continue to work for love and for passion. But he would be one of these people who aren't musicians, aren't studio owners, and will just roll in, fuck around and split, you know, whatever. But he didn't. He went out and he bought all that equipment. He bought a million dollars worth of equipment. And they put it in that room, hired some people, and had me consult. And at first, it was real hard. And I was like, you guys aren't understanding. You don't get to put a million dollars in. I told you the kind of gear you need, but the room has to grow. And it's going to take five or 10 years. And then it'll make a name for itself when good sounding. We're going to, we hired this, you know, uh, what do you call them? Um, people who have a thing that they, it's like, it's a new word. It's all internet-ish. Um, it's like a marketing word, branding. We're going to brand it. We're going to brand it this. And they hired this dude who's spending like $150,000 on this branding stuff. I was like, fuck that. You need to make a bigger control room. I know you did what you could with, you know, this, but, you know, Keelan, the young engineer who has now, is now doing, you know, blue and has come into his own as one of the finest engineers in, in the country right now. And 
Josh and, and, and um, Ryan. Anyway, they're just kids at this point. They're trying to figure it out, but they're geniuses, I could tell. So it's just awful for them though, because they're doing all this branding on stuff. Like I was like, nobody gives a fuck about branding. Artists don't care about branding. You want to get your Nashville friends because Jake turned out to be a huge lo you know, lover of music and a great guitar player, beautiful singer, a legit player. He's a great guitar player. Wanting to attract Nashville talent down here. I was like, Jake, Nashville talent all own their own studios to start with, or they're going to go to Blackbird. Like you, you can't, you got to attract the local people and make this a local nurturing spot for what's down here. The abused and forgotten people like us like me, like my husband, like all the people down here that got nobody, we got no studio, we got nothing. So you can't brand yourself into a cool studio. You have to let the studio get a name by making cool records that sound good. And then engineers talk to each other and they say, yeah, that place was cool. Oh, you tracked that there? Yeah, sounds good. And that's the only branding you're ever going to get. Let's move forward. Now, seven, eight years in, rap is what brought them mobile rap which it always was it's a black city and rap is vibrant there and so you know, the studio is now flourishing um and the young engineers are because they all looked up to me and i gave them every, once i realized that i love these guys i gave them everything i could and they stabilized my income not by having to work at the studio i told them I'm, i don't i'm not gonna ever be a staff engineer you know i'll just give you my wisdom and my name and I will make this room sound good with you. I will, I will, I will come in here and I will pee all over the place. You know, I will make it right. And uh, we did. And then separately from that, me and the boys have a deal, you know, about income. That's Dolphin Street Productions. That's a production company me and Luke made right. for me, my income. And whatever happens to me that happens good happens to the Phoebe brothers. Whatever happens to me that's bad, they help me make it through it. Even my book, if my book gets published, it'll go through Dolphin Street Productions. My book was a hit, which it won't be, but let's just say I will make them richer, man. And um, yeah, so, and it's all separate, but without them, I don't know where I'd be right now. They're my everything and I'm their everything and we love each other. Mm. Uh. <laughs> and they know it. So, but I'm so proud of Dolphin Street Sound and Blue. I met once and he has a fucking Rolls Royce pulled into the back thing where you could pull in a Rolls Royce. <laughs> I was like, yeah, there's a Rolls Royce that ain't Jake's because Jake don't, Jake's a wealthy man, but he's not that, like, he drives a shitty old pickup truck because he didn't give a shit. But, um, and Jake saw some very hard stuff come down the path for him during the time from the day I met him to today, this very moment. And he weathered it like a real Titan and like a man. For one thing, his career collapsed mm -hmm. out from underneath him because he invested a great deal in money with a, a, a person who ended up being one of the greatest Ponzi scheming nightmare robbers of athletes is who he was invested. I, Jake had to go out to Washington and testify. It became the dude's in prison, you know, like, but he, he stole millions of dollars for not just Jake, many, many other wealthy athletes. And it really fucked Jake up and his wife divorced. Like he ended up in a divorce and the dude has five kids, four kids, you know, he's got babies and, uh, that sent him reeling. And then, you know, then to find out baseball already is that fickle. It's like, boom, you worked here for, you know, a year, you're gone. And wanting music in his life and then seeing his studio draining his income stores and nothing happening yet. And me telling him, you guys, I told you, it's not going to ever earn you money. You got to do this for love, not for income and wondering if it's all going to collapse on him and then have it not. And, you know, he's doing fantastic now, but Truly, you saw a man that wasn't a spoiled, wealthy person, was not a spoiled young man that got millions and millions with an arm, a fucking gun of an arm. He's way more than that. And he proved himself to the world and to everybody he knows that he's actually a real titan, that baseball was what gave him the means to now really rise up and be like a fucking community leader of unbelievable stock and grit and his brother. Both of them love them. Wow. Excellent. And the killer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, look. So you say before you hooked up with them that you were almost at the point of like in 2015, like this, it's over. There's nothing mm -hmm. happening. But what about this Brandy Carlisle record? 
which is a few years before that. Yeah. That's like every year and a half, something decent would come through, a big production that had some money, but they never recouped. I never had, you know what I mean? They, and Brandy wasn't, Brandy was on, was, was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I had this talent, but no machine. And I had no manager. I had nothing supporting me except for me. And I had a baby. And so, yeah, Brandy's record, the Indigo Girls. I had wonderful people who still sent me work, but I wasn't getting like tons of enough work. I was not making enough money to survive. One Brandy record two years before that and another Brandy record two years later equals $16,000 in income for right. each record. I'm not getting 50 grand. I'm getting yeah. 16,000 to produce, record and mix it. And so lousy points that never recouped or a shit label like Sony who still won't recoup to me Bear Creek or show me anything about they lie and they owe me money yet I can't seem to get it. Fuck you. So if anybody out there knows the great people from Sony or whoever owns those masters, where is my accounting? Where is my money? I can't go up against them. No, they will yeah. allow you to pay for your own accountant to try and figure it out. Because that's the bullshit written into the contracts is that you can audit yeah. them at your well, own cost. Well, even Firewatcher's daughter, nobody really, well, they do, it's Firewatcher's daughter's better. They, they account, but um, barely. So it's, it's just, there's a lot of bullshit involved with major labels. I want nothing to do with them. If somebody's on a major label, I have to be paid outright in front and then have my contract set completely separately. I, I just, I, I think that we're going to leave that for the, for the big shots. Like I said, I have no architecture. I'm never going to have any. I gave up on it. It is a collapse of the infrastructure part of this, but I really only care about the sounds. And if I cared enough about the money, I would have done something about it. Have you now ever you had a manager? No. Have you ever wanted to have a manager? I tried having a manager a few times. It's just, they couldn't do anything with me. All my work came from wherever it came from. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's the case with most. I mean, like the reason I've been with Frank McDonough now for, I don't know, a really long time. And the thing I love about him is the very first thing he said to me in the first meeting is like, look, I'm not going to get your work. That's not what it's about. But it is about being a little bit of a machine underneath. And obviously there is yeah. work that comes through him because he knows people or whatever. But it is it is what you're talking about. It's the- I had one you're... decent, like a, a manager that was, you know, apparently, you know, a, a, a good enough manager that should have been able to get me work. And he flat out said, I can't, I cannot seem to get you work. I cannot seem to get, you know, you work. Um, I don't really know where to- you know, where you belong. This was in that era when my name wasn't around a lot. And I don't know. I don't know why it never happened that way. It's my fault. I mean, obviously I'm smarter than all of them. If I wanted it to happen, I would have made it happen myself, but I didn't. And now I don't generate enough income to make managers. I don't generate enough income to interest managers. I never have, and I never will. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I did not have, I did not make money on Cheryl Crow records. I think everybody needs to understand that. I got a minuscule portion of one royalty when I threatened to quit. I got nothing else. So I don't have money. I have to hack it out all the time. Right. And without it and without right now, the PV brothers supporting when it's a bad year, like it was last year, I don't make it. Right. And of course, last so it's year, a ball you wanna... player and his and his brilliant brother that have made my career possible in the last eight years, not income from records. And of course, last now year, I... you won a Grammy. For what? For Tanya Tucker. I didn't win that Grammy. Brandy Carlisle won that Grammy. My name never came up once. Did but it? you got the Did statue. Yeah, right? I got the fucking statue. But I wasn't I mean, I went out there. I wasn't part of anything other than the crew that worked on that record the fact that i spent 179 hours mixing it isn't really factored in at that point it's just <laughs> See, whoever produced it this is the problem with working hourly is you know how many hours you spent mixing yeah i fucking know exactly i would how many never want to know how many hours i've spent doing anything all i have left are hours andrew 
I need to know where they're going. I need to know that if I accept a mix for 600 bucks with the heart I put into it, I spent 14 hours on it. Mm -hmm. That's my whole day and my night where I'm not in my life. I'm alone in a room working endlessly on records where everybody else is making money but me. And I'm not doing it anymore. You want me? Pay. Fair enough. And the other rule is, it says produced by whoever, mixed by me right underneath. Did I already go through this with you? No. Why that has to be? No. I'll tell you why it has to be. I'm telling this to the crowd again. Production is a function. Or mixing oh, is we a did... function of production. Yes. Yeah, well, so no, we, we didn't talk that. about mixing in, in that context. We talked about production mixing... not being a person, but being part well, of it. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, here's the, the sidecar to that. Mixing is a function of production, not engineering. I've been doing this 35 years. I watched it go from where songs were mixed without automation, because nobody had it, on a console by either the engineer, who at that point was the mix engineer, the producer was right there, either at the board or directly behind them. The producer is producing the mix in those cases, in all cases. Then suddenly, this thing kind of changed and other producers that were also great mixers like Andy Wallace and Chad Blake agreed to mix tracks for their other producer friends. And they got their name right under the producer's name, mixed by, because they weren't mixers, they were producers. Because in order to be a mixer, you have to be a producer because mixing is a function of production. It is the end game. It is the blend, it's everything. So they were credited right with the producer because they were producers. And then it starts being where people, artists often that are don't have a producer in the room, start doing their own recordings and they don't know what they're doing and the recordings suck. And then they send it off to a seasoned producer, mixer like me to fix it and save it, make it right. Now it doesn't mean they weren't great productions, but they were shit recordings. And they're not there to figure out how does this really work? How do we bring this across the plate? Only I am there. And since I am a producer and a mixer, I am producing the mix. Unless the producer is sitting in the room calling every shot the entire time, they are not producing the mix. I'm producing the mix. Therefore, the mix is a function of production. It always was. Not engineering. My name is going right underneath the goddamn producer's name. Unless they want to book a room, fly in, and we sit in there together. But then guess what? You don't get the mix you want from me and you called me because you want the mix that I give and my mix is a production of your recording. That has been lost to this new generation. It's a shame because mixing is hard. Mixing is time, very time inclusive. It, it, it is emotionally draining and it is not something you can do until you've done a whole lot of it first. You gotta know what you're doing. I will not play second fiddle to a producer who thinks that they produced the record, therefore they're it. They did a function of the record, which was the production function. I did the other function, which is the mixing function. Those things are together. All right. Mm, how do you like it? I like it. Well, and I and think I, especially, you know, you talk about the people who are recording on their own and things like that, but it, there are lots and lots of production decisions that are left to the mixer now that yes. never used to be. And some of it's because track count, you know, you don't yes. have to combine microphones exactly. or... The producer was at least on the couch saying, no, 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 I don't want the draw. Like, you know, no, 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 wait, we got to go back. It was, yeah, and the blend of the guitar the mics was, was set in stone because it was they were yes. bounced together. So yes. the decision was made, not like, hey, man, we're giving you everything and a DI in case you want to reamp it. Like, yeah, why would I want to reamp your guitar? Like the biggest decision that you may have made as an engineer, if the producer went to dinner and then came back was whether or not you want to put a little more slap on that amp or darken it a little and a little EQ. But the producers, Dan Lanois, all those people, Chad, they were always in the room. Um and there was no such thing as this offsite mixer that's been relegated to basically an engineer that whipped it together. I need people to see. I just delivered a record for Shooter Jennings, 
that he produced and I adore him. Yeah. He understands my MO. I spent 171 hours on it. I just did my timesheet last night, 171 hours. And my timesheets are hardcore. I would log every hour. Furthermore, you could do a forensic, you know, if you had to, of the, of the drive, you could see yeah. every one of those hours worked. You could see them, all the things timestamped. I'm running it through my gear, my APIs, getting new sounds, printing it back in, like sculpting, bouncing, fixing. I will not tune vocals for people. They got to pay me $200 an hour if they think I'm going to sit around tuning vocals. Um, it, it is just such a labor of love. It's painful when it's awful. And, um, and Shooter's recordings are beautiful, yet still, how could it have taken me 171 hours? And a lot of those are because the artist is needing something entirely different than what the massive recording really is. And I have to make it into that. And Shooter wants me to, or whoever, like, like, please do this. Yes, of course I'm gonna do that. Man, if that ain't fucking production. Well, I know that it is, I produce. I've been there the whole time. There's not a person who can argue with me about it. I dare that if anybody wants to argue, put it on the comment. We'll argue. And no, it has we're to not going to person... argue about that. We're no, not going to argue about person, that. It has to be a person that's been recording for 20 years. And then he, she, or I can discuss whether or not I'm wrong because I'm not. <laughs> I'm not an asshole, you guys. I love No, no, look, I feel, I, like, I feel like we've gone to a little bit of a dark place. So let's, let's go come back. Let's go to a light place. But tell me if this is not going to take you to a light place, because I'd like to hear sort of the, the creative side to making these Brandy Carlisle records. Everything about Brandy's creative. Yeah. I mean, yeah, pick pick me something out that I could talk about that's a song. Um, oh God, you're gonna make me do that. Okay, here, I'll do that. You do I'll that. I'll do it myself. You do yeah. that. I want to hear a Brandy Carlisle story. Because I think she's sort of, you know, to the people who are not involved in where she was at before she got more successful, it looks like she just sort of exploded out of nowhere. But obviously that is not the case at all. No, that is not the case. Hang on. I just, because I'm an idiot and I have the records, hang on. I can not, just grab the CDs. Hold grab on. the CDs. She can't hear me right now. But I know better than to say anything because she'll kick my ass. Okay, so let me get my hat back on here. There we go. So the records that I worked on with Brandy are Fire Watcher's Daughter. Lovely, cute. They're very, very sweet. Mm -hmm. And Bear Creek. This yep. is the first one. Brandy, when I met Brandy, was very young. Um, it was a while ago. I mean, this thing came out in what? 2012? Yeah. So we made it in 2011, even a little bit of 2010. I had just gotten back down here. I met her through the Indigo Girls and she was delightful. Brandy, my relationship with Brandy has less to do with music, even though it is formatted in music um, and more to do with just like a bonding of like souls, like enough souls. Brandy is a force of nature, first and foremost. She is not a small person. She is not a subtle person. Brandy is one of the most dominant personalities, dominant in a good way, leader. She's a leader of people. She's a leader of the room. She's a leader of the song. She's extremely funny. She's extremely smart and wildly talented. She understands what the nature of celebrity is she is, understands the architecture of it. She knows exactly what she wants. And she is a brilliant businesswoman. Absolutely shit hot businesswoman. Wow. Brandy Carlisle has more widespread talent in her body than any 10 people, 10 proficient people I know. So she is one of those people that was destined to rise. There was no question that meant right when I met her that Brandy Carlisle will be very, very famous um, and get exactly what she wants. I knew that instantly 
I knew that Brandy needed something from me and I gave it to her. She doesn't need it anymore. She wants it sometimes. She likes my mixes a lot. She does not need me. She has gone so far past me um, because she's a machine maker. She makes not just the music, but the machine that ushers the music forward. What I gave Brandy, now I'll just mix for her. Great. Okay. I'm a good mixer. She knows what, uh, she likes the way I hear, you know, so that's not really anything to talk about. Brandy needed to know that I recognized her greatness, her like magnificence and gave her a few pointers about exactly what she needed to do to certainly not do what I didn't do. Like, for example, early in Bear Creek, this is a lovely record. I've been gone for so long. That's my favorite song. It's called Whatever Did, Whatever Did I, Whatever, What Did I Ever Come Here For? It's a tongue twister. So showed up. Brandy's a little bit shy. Twins are not shy at all. They're tattooed. They're real handsome. I'm worried that they're going to be church people or something. I don't know. I, I, I felt like Brandy was real Christian. Wasn't really sure how far that went. And so I was on my best behavior, no cussing, no weed, like nothing. Um, but then I realized she, she, she is a person of spiritual bigness. Um, the twins are not that they were as rude as any people I'd ever met in my entire life, like funnier. I mean, Tim made a mistake. And on the talk back, this is what unleashed the floodgates. He said, Oh shit. Fuck my dick hole. <laughs> and I just was like, Thank God. <laughs> My people. I can, I can swear because it's really building up. So they're irreverent and hilarious. But Brandy didn't want to play her own guitar parts. She wrote the songs on acoustic and she wasn't that good of a player either. You know, she's like, oh, you know, and she wasn't owning it. And I was just, you know, that Tim there was brilliant and Phil too, but they weren't the best musicians ever. They were just powerful, passionate, brilliant songwriters who were figuring it out, right? But Brandy was just T-Bone said that I'm way ahead of the beat. And, you know, he replayed a lot of my guitars. And I know that she and T-Bone came, found a place for her. But, you know, he was a little hard on her and, you know, not wanting to deal with a shitty rhythm hand. Well, look, I don't want to deal with a shitty rhythm hand either. I hate it. All I care about is rhythm. The rest of it is a waste of time if there's no great pocket. And she did not have a great pocket. And yet her body had a great pocket. Her voice had a great pocket. So I think I just gave her enough belief in herself that her guitar playing, the nature of it was really unique and she just had to get her pocket together. She had to learn to play the guitar and play it well and then play it better than well, then play it proficiently, own it. Because if you don't own that guitar, you're not going anywhere. You're not. And she didn't play piano at that point. I was like, you don't, you are not a skilled musician and it sucks for you because you are a skilled vocalist, but it's actually not enough. Not enough to make the song feel the way you need it to feel. And therefore everything's disappointing for you and it never feels magic. You are, even if, if Tim wrote the song, Hell's Bells, Tim's playing the guitar part and he's owning it and it's feeling great. What about all these songs you wrote the guitar part for? Cause they all share their writing. They're all, a, they're writing triangulation and signed as such, you know, there is no, Brandy Carlisle. Brandy Carlisle is an entity that is signed. Right. And Tim, Phil, and Brandy are all, you know, equal members of Brandy Carlisle. So, and they all write equally. But what about your songs? You know, you write these beautiful songs and you play them shitty. Why? Why don't you learn how to play the guitar? Like, you write on it. Like, don't you get the outrageous rhythm hand and what that does to people? And then she did that and she made herself a great guitar player. And then she burst onto the scene and it was never, never stoppable. Your face is wobbling. No, 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 it's going right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, your camera's a little uh little fuzzy too. Yeah, we're having some we're having some rendering. But yeah. anyway, I think that I gave her the gift of go learn your instrument, not just your voice, and play. Like be a feel player. Because if you're got great rhythm and you're a great singer and you're a great writer, how who's gonna stop you? Who can get in your way then? Nobody. And did she learn during the course of that record or she, I mean, she could obviously sit there with a guitar and go, yeah. okay. You know, her proficiency after that conversation about that song, which was, hang on a second. Um, I 
I want to remember exactly what. I'm having trouble remembering which one it was on Bear Creek, but it was on Bear Creek. Um, that we sat there and she was playing me. It could have been on Firewatcher's Daughter. Hang on a second. But it doesn't matter. Anyway, the song, she, she'd written a song and it's on one of these records. Um, and, you know, she had the guitar part and she's like, well, Tim will play all this. And I was like, why? I said, you're kind of fucking it up, but it's not locking with your voice. Like we just, I was like, your guitar part's really cool that you've written. Well, no, no, this will all be different. I was like, but why? Like that's, you just wrote this song. You came in to play it to me. I'm your producer. I'm telling you the guitar part you just wrote is the guitar part for the song, but you play it shitty. So go, we're not cutting this song until you go learn how to, to, why should Tim play this? For one thing, he's not gonna play it exactly like you and you wanna catch it fresh, but you don't play it good enough. No, it was during that song that she started, she determined, I will, I will be a great guitar player. Over the rest of the course of the record, she got better and better. Fire Watcher's daughter, she got better and better and better. And then she went with Dave and then she got even better and better and better. Um, she owned her rhythm. I think that's what I gave Brandy more than anything else. Right. And it's, it's yeah. hard to, to overstate how important that is. The songwriter playing rhythm guitar on their song, if they've written it on guitar, there's yeah. absolutely nothing else on the planet that's anything like it. Exactly. Especially when it's not just good enough, when it's badass and it starts to have riffs in it. When suddenly yeah. you're not just strumming along, you're hooking up your riffs too. You're like doing your fills and your rhythm and finger picking. Then your Doc Watson at that point. You're like you're you're unstoppable. Yeah. And that I believe that, and and Tim is already that when he sings his own songs, but he's not the lead vocalist. No, so exactly. It's because it, it's it. all built around what you're going to be singing. Right. And so you know she. I think that I saw her own it in her eyes. That's what I mean by this this monstrously powerful woman. She stared at me. I said, well, you, you suck on the guitar, kind of. I mean, but you don't have to. It's like you've decided you play ahead and therefore you're going to play ahead. Stop it. Being ahead is annoying. Play it right. Like go practice to a metronome. Why don't you have a metronome? And instead of like getting an attitude or just being like, well, I'm not going to do it. Tim's going to do it. She, I could see her eyes changed and she decided, oh yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. And then, then she I mean, it took a few years. It wasn't like she then the next day was yeah, just yeah. amazing. But now she is a badass rhythm guitar player. So she understood she was missing a crucial piece. And she took it upon herself to find that piece and then, then you know, capitalize on it. Right. Now, there's no question. Brandy talked to me about once deciding she was going to be a preacher. She was going to go to the seminary school and become a preacher because she wasn't happy with the way the label handled Bear Creek, I guess it was, or even maybe Firewatcher's daughter, and uh, or whatever else it was. And she's like, fuck it, I'll just be a preacher. I'll go to seminary school. I was like, well, you could do that. Be a politician. She could run for president and she'd win. You know, she's very, very, very. Have you ever been in a room with her? No, no. They'll fuck you up. She's powerful, but she's funny too. So she's like Bruce. She is very much like Bruce. They don't make you feel stupid or little or weird or anything. They just make you feel like, whoa, you're a little bit of a thoroughbred. I'm going to get up next to you. You know, just because it feels good to stand next to a magnificent creature. Yeah. Anyway, she's magnificent. Yes. Yeah. But that that's fascinating because I, I really, it's one of the, um, the things I really learned from, I made a record with Don Was and the songwriter, same sort of thing. She'd written a lot of stuff on guitar, didn't want to play. And he's like, look, you, you have to play. You just, you got to do it. And it transformed every single song. Right. And then if that person then went on to love the guitar and decide, I'm not just going to learn my songs. I'm going to learn to be that person who can grab a, an acoustic and play anybody's song and be that person who everybody loves that person because they play everybody's songs great. Yeah. Meep. And she's easy to record otherwise. Super, you know, she's not niggly or weird or she doesn't get like super hung up on like nuance of tone that doesn't need to be worried about or nobody needs to care about just to put her dick in the mashed potatoes. She doesn't, you know, there's none of that. It's like, yeah, that sounds cool. 
you know, like is is that it's, a is that a local phrase? No, that's Beastie Boys, bro. Oh, okay, right. I know yeah. I've heard it, but yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. No, I'm it's not been that a while. cool. Yeah, <laughs> but it's still it's still relevant. I think Dick and the Mashed Potatoes. It's only fun for one person. <laughs> is it even fun for that person? I think probably. I don't have a dick. I have no idea. I'd have to put my boob in the mashed potatoes, and that doesn't sound as fun. Now, I'm only asking this because I'd imagine you've actually thought about it. If you had a dick, would you be putting it in the mashed potatoes? No, because I would find that unhygienic, and I, w- I don't yeah. think like the consistency of mashed potatoes would be yeah. at all. No unless interest there was, like, in that. Butter in there, and then that's even not. And I would be worried about stuff getting in my urethra. Yeah. You know, like the the, the hole there. Yeah, in um, your I dick hole. Yeah, yeah, in your dick hole, I wouldn't want anything to get in there that would be like starchy um, or buttery. So I would not put my dick in the mashed potatoes. All right, good. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, I dreamt once that I had a penis. Like I had a real dream. And in as I came to waking in that moment, I was like, holy shit. And if it's only ever happened once, you just dreamed that you had an actual like a dick. Like I was a, me, but I was in bed. And, I, and And the dream was only that I was laying in my bed and I had a dick. But I was like, wow, that's cool. Totally cool. I would love it. I would have a lot of fun. <laughs> I love being a girl. But I mean, I was like, yeah, man, that's what it feels like. It was almost like I got to see my male side just in a glimpse. It wasn't hard or anything. There was nothing going on either. It was just laying there on my belly. Wow. I was like, that's my dick that I don't have. Huh? <laughs> weird, right? That was a long time ago. Sorry, people. All of this is weird. Anybody who can't take it should hang up now. No, it's not weird at all. So it is. look. We could talk about other records, and we didn't really talk about Indigo Girls. We could do that, but there, there are a couple other sort of bigger picture things. So, if are, are there any other records you want to mention? No, I, okay. I won't be able to remember any record except the ones you tell me about. Okay. Um, because we we touched on the Tanya Tucker thing. I don't think we need to go back there, but I love Tanya Tucker, and I love mixing that record. I never met Tanya Tucker. She's got an iconic voice, though. Yeah. I knew I was in the presence of more than just a great singer. I was in the presence of a voice that changed the, the genre, made a new genre that other people, Brandy herself included, Cheryl Crow, all of them mimicked that phrasing, that way that she comes off her words, what she does with the spaces between her words is absolutely magnificent. Yeah. And it's, it's a weird, I've been trying to get my head around this a little bit because like, Obviously, she is absolutely amazing, but I think you'd have to be lying to yourself if you thought that the reason that album was so successful wasn't because it was produced by Brandy and like that had this up and coming young artist gets the traditional artist and makes a big deal. And Jack White's done that a couple of times. And yeah, it's a it's a thing that happens. And I don't part of me is like well fuck at least they're getting some of the recognition they should be getting anyway and part of me feels like they're almost being dragged around like a party piece in a way and i know that's not the way that the people making the records feel about they are worshiping these people and just want to make a record with them but it has a little bit of a weird feel to me and i'm just i've i mean i don't even know why i brought that up but it's just something i i think about especially when i saw them at the grammys and it's like well why isn't she winning every fucking time she puts out a record and sometimes it's because they don't make the greatest records or don't make great choices in between and you know there are reasons johnny cash had dips in his career but still i think that actually what's what's happening and and it seems a little weird especially in our current era is just using you know Brandy and Shooter's production of of Tanya's record, and then of course the writing of an entire record expressly for her, because you know they wrote the yeah. record for her. Yeah, I think that all they did was harken back to an old model that just is had became passe in the '70s, which was a production team took an artist, created the entire body of work, including the material and made the record happen around a personality or a voice that was the entity that was the artist. And that's all they did, but they happened to take an artist that was known, you know, no different than taking a very young artist that nobody knows about that doesn't really play instruments. And that just is, you know, an iconic, has a a voice, you know, kind of like Amy Winehouse they did with, you know, cause I don't think Amy 
she may have played instruments, whatever the point is like, here's this wildly talented right. young unknown person. We're going to surround her with an entire production that is going to carry her voice. That's, they just did that with Tanya. Tanya just happened to be known before. Right. But I don't know that it's any different. Well, than... it's the entire record business pre Beatles. I mean, it's, Yes, record. exactly. So that's yeah. what I mean. So they're just using a model of production by taking a known quantity, which is a voice that's recognizable and has a quality that's unique, and 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 enough of a. She could have been a young chick that had a little following behind her, or an old chick that had a leftover following behind her. Either way, the young chick or the old chick, she's got a signature sounding voice. Yeah, that is unique. I think that is what is actually at play here is the signature sounding voice. And then enough interest from very talented production crew that decided to do it to her. Right. And I suppose for them, I mean, what a gift to be able to write a record for someone they look up to that much and then have her actually make it. Yeah. And then even for me to get to mix a voice that has these qualities that I'm talking about, this sonic uniqueness and it, and, 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 and is part of also the reality of my coming of age and and she's a and she's a rebel you know and she's a badass um and then just have that 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 tone come out that nobody sounds like tanya tucker i mean nobody came before her that sounded like tanya right. tucker and then there's tanya tucker now a lot of people sound like tanya tucker i could hear all the places that all these singers have mined from tanya not intentionally just naturally just like people not copy Cheryl Crow you know and it's like wow so many chicks sound like Cheryl Crow I was in the grocery store the other day I was like this got to be a new Cheryl Crow song the girl's like no that's so and so I was like that is an exact mimic of Cheryl Crow's styling like right down to the everything which made me laugh because Cheryl would be thrilled because you know we're not getting younger Cheryl is now a classic artist right considered considered to be so so I think that you know their ageism wanting to be around these like you know these these elders um because they are our elders they learn a lot you know a lot about like i don't know i don't actually know i'm glad they called me for the mix i loved mixing it i spent a shitload of time on it and um and it came out right and they're happy and tanya's happy and uh and i guess the world is happy with it yeah you, do you like it yeah cool hell yeah all right let's talk about something that isn't a record let's talk about the fact that your book has a title mira and everly yes hey do you want to see something i do want to see out. something yeah. meanwhile i could show you my toothpick which i have hanging from it three of the little ties you get when you buy little apple cables it's kind of fun so, fidget so yeah i printed out for myself a good old-fashioned nice manuscript look at this you can't i know you can't see it on there but holy shit your book's too long What's no going no on? it's um well no for a for a manuscript you have to have it times new roman yeah 12 point double double space double space single side and my book is 109,000 words, which is actually in the realm of a of a modern novel. So how many pages is that about? It's just 320 some pages. Right. If it wasn't double spaced, it would probably be 310 pages, about 300 pages. Nice. It's not tiny, but it's written. So, down. so where are you at with it? Where are I'm you, done with it. You're done. Well, a friend of mine, a very dear friend um, in Nashville, who's a published writer and a musician, a famous musician, he likes my book a lot, and I let him read it. And he said that he would, and it has already happened, it just happened a few weeks ago, uh, send my manuscript, a printed copy just like that, to a very famous editor who's a big deal but only takes paper manuscripts that he agreed to read it based on Rodney's description alone and another lady who's a reader but also a very um I looked at her stuff I was like damn she's legit both these people agreed to read it as from Rodney's my, my friend Rodney's recommendation they have it now so I'm obviously like I don't know what to think I think if they hate it 
it's all right. If they love it, it's all right. If they want me to change it, I probably will. If they say that I should, I'll listen to them. If they don't even ever respond, I'll know they didn't like it and I'll just publish it myself. Wow. So it's been sent out, but you haven't heard a word back. No, it'll take a while. I mean, it's big. Yeah, and, that's um, brutal. And, you know, and I'm, I'm not at, probably at the top of these people's lists, but I do know that they, I guess this is what I think. The two people who have it now at an agent who has agreed to read it also, but but Rodney and she both suggested let this editor and this other lady have a go first to maybe there's some crucial input that can make it even better. Right. Factor that in. And then the agent said that she would read it. These are the top of the line people. I don't have to submit synopsises or any of that bullshit. These are like the John Grish. Like, in other words, these are the heavy hitters. If they just flat out shoot it down, I'll know that I'm not going to like the mid-level publishers. Then I'll just put the book out myself and call it a day. Right, right. Everybody who's read it has seemed to really like it. But it, I made it for me. I adore it. It is the world I live in now. It's always in my head. These characters have been alive in me for 56 years. Now they're on a page. Now they exist. And are and these the same own. characters that are in your song stories? Or this is a oh, parallel yes. thing? So same thing. I, yeah, basically what I've done is taken all the characters that I've had throughout all my song stories and merged them and aggregated them into two you know, main characters that can now just be standalone and now everything is them. When I get nervous and anxious, which is a lot, now I just, they sit with me. They're my imaginary motherfucking friends. I give them adventures to go on. We do stuff together. They bear stuff for me. I bear stuff for them. I, it's bizarre, but I'll never leave this world. I'm stuck in it forever. And is I one of them, them named Chad? <laughs> no. My <laughs> hero is Ever Lee, and my heroine is Mira Morris. Her full name is Miroslava Medvedika Morris. She's a Slovak. Wow. That's an old family name of ours. So, Interesting. Anyway, they're fantasies. And they exist in my book. Well, and I look forward Mira. to reading this. Now, you look good to read it someday. Now, here's, here's a question for you. Because these stories are, some of them must be tied to individual songs because they came from that right i mean no this book no. does not represent so my this is own. abstracted from this is a love story that i crafted out of my imagination of two people who fall in love and a record gets made yes but there's also a murder uh you know bodies getting tossed in the river there is the dawning of the internet there is the end there's the collision of analog and digital, but mostly there is her survival as a type one diabetic. There is just, it's a book of blood, sugar, music, sex, death. Blood, sugar, life. sex, magic, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, so, it's, and it and is. And the Greek, Greek myths. There's like, it's got a Greek. So the, the book takes place backdrop. in the same universe as all of your song stories, but it is its own. The Thank book you. takes place specifically in the year 1995 during the month of July in the city of New Orleans. It all happens in a month in New Orleans in 1995. Right. And it has a very, it's got a plot, you know, it's like a, it's a proper novel. Uh, it, there's not a single living real person in it. Everything right. is fictional with the exception. Ahmet Erdogan makes a <laughs> guest appearance at the very end because he's my hero. <laughs> And so does Bruce it's nice. to give my hero and heroine at the very end. Don't, of what don't give it be away. The beginning of their journey. I won't. It, okay. But he offers them the same advice he offered me. And if it ever came to publishing, I'm sure he would allow it because I, I, it's just the advice he sat across from me and gave me. I, I let him give to my hero and heroine. But otherwise, there's no like it's not a story of recordings. It's not a story of what happens in the studio. It's a love story that has to take place sometimes in studios because I don't really know anything else that good. And Mira has an obsession with equipment and a, you know, she has a gear fetish like me. So she understands equipment and, uh, and she loves it. So is it a spoiler to, to get a sense of what this advice is? No, it's not a spoiler Do you mind, do you mind sharing that? You? I'll just read it to you. 
Well, the fictional version or the the real the fictional life version. version are the words he said. Okay, then I I would. But it's easier if I just read it to you because I yeah. got I I I remembered it, but then well, in writing it down, I was. Able I to and several thousand it. people watching this definitely would like to hear this because I think we all could use some advice from the boss. Almost there. I know where my shit is up in my book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm not going to give you the backstory of why my hero and heroine happen to be no. in a restaurant that they, you know, but the point is. Gum out for this. Yep. Yep. Let me tell you something. This is Bruce speaking. Bruce, I will give you the sentence before. Bruce pins her with a direct, empathetic gaze, which makes her start to sweat. Let me tell you something. This is the good stuff, kid. This is when it gets real, Bruce says to her. The rest of this, he spreads his arms, looking at Ever, is nothing in comparison. My oldest son turns five in three days, and I have a four-year-old daughter and a one-year-old baby boy, Bruce says to the both of them. Then there's a little more dialogue, and then Bruce says, I suffer from depression, Bruce says candidly. It's taken me years to understand that you have no control over a lot of the bad things that have already come your way. And you can't live your life worried about all of the bad things that might, that might happen or could happen, but have not happened, he says, tapping the table with each of his last three words for emphasis. That's it. That's there you go. I know that sounds simple, but when Bruce tells you, you listen. No, and it's it's. And we all do it. It's of course. What if this happens? What if this happens? That happened, and now yeah. what if this happens? And then you can and get paralyzed just, by it and not do anything. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, but it, it it resonated with me then, and it still does now because I did live in fear of all of the bad stuff that had already happened. Sure, that more bad stuff had to come my way. How could it not? How could it have? How could that many bad things happen and then not more be coming and then really wait for them to come? And that's what our, our conversation was about, was how to get through. I mean, he and I talked for a long time, but that was the gist of the advice. You have to, you know, you have to let go of what you think. You have to not already be scared about the bad th shit that hasn't even happened yet. Wait for that. You you can be sh you can feel terrible about that when right. it actually happens. It has not happened yet. Right. It's not going to make you feel better about it by worrying about it now. No. So, but other than um, Ahmed Erdogan and Bruce Springsteen, who have cameo appearances, my book truly is there. There's no no living person is is depicted. But Bruce will play himself in the movie. <laughs> He's a young man then. It's 1995. All right. So who are you going to get to play him then? Nobody. I would not. I would want no part of this becoming a movie. If people wanted that, that would be outside of my jurisdiction, and I would have given it to them at that point. No, you can't give it to them. You got to keep some control over it. So when you're oh, when you're doing when you're doing the ten episode it. version of it for Showtime. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I I I I I don't have. Um, th these people are are made up in my mind. What they look like, and not Bruce though. So somebody. Who somebody Are, who looks like Bruce could be Bruce. Well, who would play Mira know. and Ever? Any ideas? I could not tell you. No, there. Who current people now? Who these people are twenty seven when the story is told. Who are the twenty seven ish year old people who represent what is in my mind? I don't know who those people are. I don't. I don't watch television. So I don't know. Right. I really don't. Yeah. Don't Fair enough. Well, obviously, wish you incredibly good fortune and you don't need Thank luck you. but it will come out for good or ill because it will be my single contribution to the creative pool being creative on other people's art is me being a brilliant editor that's my heart that's my my heart right there so and i won't write another one it wore me out <laughs> well in a way it's your life's work isn't it it is it is my life's work and, and it might suck it's and it's an interesting thing because I, I think that there's there's a very weird category that we live in that doesn't really exist in a lot of other art forms where you are a major creative contributor, but you are not the creator. Right, exactly. 
And I'm an editor and a blender with a gear fetish. I am not the creator. Yeah. But, but it then, turns out. But then to move yeah. into a completely different artistic genre and create. Yeah. Is that something? It's powerful. It changed my whole life. Now, but see, the thing is, I don't have to write another book because these characters, they live so powerfully inside me now that they're help. They keep me young. See, look how young I am right now. See, see so me. young. I'm young. I'm horny. <laughs> I'm engaged to the world around me. I see it as a kid again, and I get them. They're they're in me. They they exist. They I, I have I have made uh, characters. They provide me with the love that I did not get when I needed it. Everything that I need, I now just get from them. They feed me. I'll never let them go. I'll die with them in my casket. Can I suggest another book that I really think you might want to write after you've taken sure. a break? Is some of the stories that go with songs, whether it's songs you worked on or not, that you just have a, sh a book of short stories that tells you what song right. to listen to as you read it. I could write that because... In he, that that is Mira's imagination is like mine, where like, and a lot of the of, a lot of the um, of the symbols that are part of my stories that are in a lot of my songs are all over the book: fireflies, bears, honey, you know, like all of the, the horses, like all the phantasmic shit that I love so much. My aromatics, my rocks; these are all part of you know, the book and they populate my personal story. So I could write that book, you know, I could write the story of what I, what happens when, yeah, I could do that easily. I mean, not easily, but I could fathom that. Would you mind just telling one story to go with one song just because I'm fascinated? You don't have to though. Tell me to fuck off. That's fine. Well, this isn't a song though that I mixed. Because I have the stories for songs I didn't make. No, exactly. Either. It doesn't matter whether it's... I, I don't mind either way. I'm just curious, like, what the stories are that go with songs. Because it's fascinating it's, it's, to me. It, it's difficult. I mean, it's, I guess the book does kind of depict that. I have a song. You know, okay, there's a song that I love that a lot of people love. And that song is uh, called um, Karina by Taj Mahal got a bird one whistle oh it's just you know he's on like a steel a, a slide guitar or a dobro and it's a real simple groovy song um in my book there's a moment when my hero is tracking a song and of course in my fantasy that's the song he's tracking i get to give him whatever songs i want so he just he just wrote karina and he sits down to track it but he doesn't have all the words together yet and Mira brings him his words, but he, her, the words arrive via fireflies that I would have to read it to you. It would be embarrassing for me to try to tell one of my stories. No, no, That's no, why no. It took so long no, don't worry about them. it. Don't worry about it. Um, it's how they appear to him and how they appear to her and how they become like a mirror ball in his and light up even in the inside of his skull and then the mirror ball arcs to his balls and his balls light, light up like a Tesla ball. And, you know, it's just like Ever's nutsack lights up like a Tesla ball. That's what I said, you know, and <laughs> it's the way that that's one of my narratives that I would have running through a song that like, I love this song. I love the sound of this person's voice. What if, you know, this was actually happening and this person was singing it and it came out of his mouth and from the chandeliers dropped down what he thought were fireflies, but he thinks he's actually tripping on mushrooms, you know, but he's not right, sure if the right. words are coming. Then all of a sudden out of his mind, it's like they burst forth and his nutsack lights up like a tussle ball and the words are there, you know, and he just can pluck them and he, and he belts them out with that magnificent voice. And meanwhile, she is the fireflies. She brings the fireflies because the fireflies are her messengers and they're bobbing and dancing to his rhythm. And all of a sudden his voice comes out and it's like a Persian runner and the Persian runners floating across the room and all the fireflies hop on it. And when it passes over her head, she waves and then it hits the head stack and it explodes. She knows it's a hallucination. Those are the kind of stories I make up. Right. And then they don't always have to be studio. That's a studio one. Sometimes they're not even in studios. Right, right. They're on a street somewhere. But they always have to do with the voice, you know, 
and the and the and and they rarely have to do with the lyric of the of the song right. that I'm loving. They have to do with like this emotional context that I put it in, and then the love story where that song is part of my life, but in a very real way. And I usually give it to my characters. Right. So like abstract so, visual poems. Yes. Sort of. Yes. But the book had to have like a story. It couldn't just be yeah. a series of abstract visual poems. Um, they're very childish in some ways, you know? They're just like, what would it really feel well, like? Well, I mean, are they childish or are they just pure? I mean, they're, they're pure. You yeah. know, what would it feel like to ride on Greg Allman's uvula when he sang? <laughs> like to actually be able to ride on it, you know, as it flapped around inside his mouth. I, that's one of my stories. Right. You know, sometimes it seems like you could just be little and crawl into their throat and grab onto their uvula and just swing on it. And it would be sing. like the Miley Cyrus wrecking ball video. What happens in that? <laughs> she sits on a wrecking ball and swings back and forth. I'm joking because it's oh, just right. a ridiculous. Um, no, thing. but you know what I mean? Like, like there's something about the tone of his actual voice that, you know, that yeah. brings about all kinds of stories you could think of. And then the songs that I'm working on, I have a whole different narratives for them too. And sometimes I make the singer way better than they are. <laughs> you know, in my mind, I'm mixing a song and I don't really like the singer's voice. So I just, in the narrative, the singer the, is a much better singer. <laughs> so that as I spend those hours and hours and hours making that person sound as best I can, in my mind, I've decided the voice is other. It's That's, not. It's a different voice altogether. It's. I it's can't like, hear this voice anymore. It's like getting a tattoo of a much better looking person on your face. Yes, <laughs> I enhance. Do you want to see my tattoo? Do I? It's on my thigh. You tell me if I, I want to see your tattoo. This would involve disrobing. You do. Check it out. All right. No. Well, sort of. I think I can do this right though without it getting weird. I got to move my camera. I wonder if I'm allowed to do that. If you're it's allowed to, good. I think it's. I your mean, camera. I'm allowed to. I don't want anybody to see my underwear. Is the no, no, no. We don't want to see it. It's a family show. And it, and for the audio-only podcast, this is going to be amazing. All right. So you can't see anything other than my thigh right now, right? Well, no. It's a little bit, little, little crotch action, oh, actually. Everybody can get over it. I'm old. You're going to have to see. All right, hang on. I'm going to do this different. Yeah, do it. I got a plan. All right. I'm getting up in front of my chair. Good. Hi, everybody. I got this. I got this. This is going to work. All right. Right. We're blocked. If there. you fall over, we don't have insurance, just so you know. Wow. There it is. See the horse? Yeah. Are we getting it? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, it's yep, under yep. the shadow, though. It's nope. beautiful. You can't really see him. That's my horse, Rufus. He's got fireflies up in his mane. <laughs> anyway, so that's it. I'm, I'm covering my entire legs with tattoos. That's my plan. That's it. So you're getting leg sleeves now. Leg sleeves, yeah. Leg sleeves with Completely, your horse. Top to bottom. No, not just with horses. I'm also getting the, the other horse isn't going to have fireflies in a mane. It's going to have little tiny rolls of Ampex, four, five, six. And the tape's <laughs> going to spin off into the mane. And on the bottom, I'm going to do a big old head stack assembly from an A80 <laughs> and some other pieces of gear and some meters. And also my dog that died, who I love. Like I'm just covering my entire legs with tattoos of everything that I love. And why, why legs? Because, I mean, I'm assuming... I don't like were... my legs. They're ugly. Do they that's reach why. the ground? Yeah, they work great. They're real then, strong. They're then, super powerful. Then that's Because awesome. I, don't, I, like, I don't like to sit on the toilet and look down at my fat cellulite old lady thighs. So I thought, <laughs> well, I'll cover them in tattoos. And then when I'm looking down at them, I'll be in a good mood. And I think they're the cool. And, the and the beach will be... I don't go... Oh, no, I never... I, I'm afraid of skin cancer. I always wear yoga. I don't wear bathing suits. I right. wear yoga pants and a... Sleeve. So no one's going to see him except you. Exactly. Or yeah, you're, you're, you know, these people just got to see one. Yeah. Yeah, I might wear shorts now and then, but no, I don't show. They're all for me. It's right. all to commemorate my my um, things that I dig. Tape Sorry, machines, people. dogs, and horses. Tape machines, dogs, and horses, and fireflies. And fireflies. Mm -hmm. Other stuff too. And yeah, I'll probably get some crystals. I mean, we didn't show everybody. No, yet. no, we didn't show the crystals. Amazonite. Beautiful. Oop, this is a gypsum. I found this myself. Yes. In a scree ball. Nice. On the Colorado River. Lapis lazuli, please. A, oh, yeah. This is the lapis. It's a shame that you can't really see the blue of the lapis. Let me try to light it up here a little bit. 
Oh, look at that lapis lazuli. There you go. That Ooh. yeah. We were talking you about that, that before, and that yeah. that's the Egyptian deep blue thing. Yes, and it's amazing. Very very deep blue, super cool. I also have a uh, rhodochrosite. I got that out of a mine, a rhodochrosite mine. That was scary. Anyway, yeah, I like this stuff, all of it. And we got to talk about your your closet artisanal perfumery. Yeah, we should. So it turns out I have to get a prop for this. Do we have time for me to do that? Yep, we got all the time in the world. All right, and can I? I had a pee too, so I'll just be right back. Yeah. Okay. I could show them the uh, little spinny guys. It's kind of fun, except they sit upside down, and you wouldn't think they would get stuck that way, but they do sometimes. It's kind of weird. I'm constantly, I'm fidgeting because I'm fidgeting. So, oh, I caught the sun today. You can kind of see that, and I'm really greasy. And for the podcast, again, this is going to be fantastic, this part. I got, uh, what do we got, tape measure? Oh, you might have noticed, by the way, speakers behind me, and we got the four speakers overhead. And tomorrow... We're tuning the room, so I will be fully Atmos compliant, which I'm very excited about. I've started messing around with it, and it's actually so much fun. It's insane, blowing a song out across the whole room. It's really good. It's really good. I am enjoying this and looking forward to doing more of it, and I will do more of it. But right now, I'm going to have a little sip of water. That's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not really sure what else to show you. I got a mechanical pencil. I think you've seen that. It's nice. Had this for a really long time, actually. Like years and years. Back, Got it back in L.A. And I've lived here for six and a half years or something like that. So that. I could show you my clock. This was actually a gift from Neil Diamond. Just showing him my clock. Hila. All right. So this is, of course, a bottle of vintage Shalimar. Obviously. Made, made by Jacques Guerlain, who is one of my heroes. He's up there with Ahmed Erdogan. So Jacques Guerlain is quoted as having, oh, God, this shit smells so good. It's unbelievable. I rarely let myself put any on. It's real hard to find now, the vintage stuff. Um, he loved women. Horses and fragrance. That's my kind of guy. I, mean, I like dudes, but I like women too, but I like guys, you know, for in the way he met. So anyway, I know people said that he was a Nazi sympathizer, but I read did a bunch of reading. I don't think the Gerlain family really was. What they wanted to do was survive. So anyway, that's beside the point. It's always awful when you think, oh no, now I can't love your perfume if you were like hanging around with Nazis. But um the thing is, you can't get this, like, modern perfumes, all the cool stuff got banned that's in that, right. okay? That makes it so magnificent, starting with something called Tonquin Deer Musk. Now, you have to kill little gorgeous, sweet, pretty little deer to get this stuff, and I have some. I had to have it sent in from Canada because it's illegal to have it's it. fucking Canadians again. Canadians, you know. Fuck. But this came from the seventies. The obviously the deer was already dead, and um, <laughs> well, it doesn't I mean, change it. Yeah. I had to allow myself one time a one time purchase. I'll never buy it again. You cannot believe how this stuff smells when it's aged. It's amazing. It is enthralling. So perfumes are mixed with bass notes, middle notes, and top notes, just like music, and. They have little things called accords in them, which are combinations of middle notes that create a whole new scent that fragrance that's like, let's say you're using something like, um, uh, musk is a, is a base note, but if you were using for the middle, like a rose and a patchouli and um, a uh, coumarin, all right, um, which is tonka bean, those would you wouldn't use together, but let's just say use these. And these are pure aromatics. These are the absolutes or CO2s from those substances. And you combine them and they make a whole new smell that is not like any of them is a brand new. That's called an accord. And then so perfumes are super complicated and they are compositions of the highest magnitude. 
like a uh, like a great you know like like by Mozart like a symphony. So there's a reason Jacques Erlain, when he invented Shalimar, is still famous today. It made an empire. There's a reason Chanel Number no. Five. It created an empire because those things are not easy to come by, and the shit that goes in them is expensive. So if you mess it up, you got to throw it away. There's no saving it. So I stopped blending my expensive components into things that I could end up having to throw away. And I just smell them individually. And sometimes I'll dab them on little things like agar wood, very rare, very, very expensive, like a little teeny bottle of agar wood resin that big, it's 300 bucks. And is it from a type of tree? Yes, it is from right. the agar wood tree. Okay. It's also known as oud. Um, it's a, it's now, it's cause now everything's synthesized too. So you can get like these synthetic things, but they don't smell anything like the real. And some of the stuff's banned because it has allergens in it. And, but I have some exquisite CO2s and absolutes of some beautiful, beautiful aromatics that are, just smell so crazy. And I just, I get really excited by just smelling the little bottles, you know, the, the, but I stopped blending them because I can't make Shalimar and I went through a couple thousand dollars worth of wasted. I've made a few little nice blends, but I can't repeat them. <laughs> it's music is way easier to blend than, than perfumes, but, but I just, I wear, but I love me this Shalimar. So is that why you started? You were trying to recreate that? No, I, I've been obsessed with smells it's like my sense of hearing and my sense of smell are both overactive. My sense of sight is crap. Um, so like things that smell really good to me or really bad to me, I can smell stuff other people can't smell or don't smell. I can hear stuff other people don't seem to be hearing. And not like fantasy. I'm like, you don't hear that TV just turned on next door. I can hear that. You know, or I'll pick up a scent of something that like my son's like, I don't smell it at all. My husband will say barely, and I'll be like, Jesus, it's all I can smell. So I'm just fascinated with aromatic stuff. And then learning how it was blended, much like music, made me like kind of dive in headlong. But then I found out in order to be a, like a real artisan perfumer, I would need at least $75,000 of capital to get up and going. And nobody would be able to afford this shit because I made one little bottle of stuff that smells real good and I have the recipe. It would be prohibitive for me to actually make. It would be way too expensive to buy the, you know, the components of that. Uh, it's an expensive endeavor. Well, ball players' wives like to smell good. <laughs> it, but now I just realized I do have a couple little blends. I've got my love potion number nine. Ooh, with labdomen labdanum and vanilla and sandalwood that shit is nice it smells like candle wax from an old temple that's my wow. little blend so i do real simple blends but i'm not going to try to do something like shalimar because there's probably 45 notes in this wow. a note is the single aromatic yeah but all of it correlates to music you know so i love having Cause it's right in the room next door. All of my aromatic stuff is spread out. All my rocks are in there. So whether I'm narrating my story or looking at my rocks as part of the story or getting like a little fragrance thing going at all, it's all part of how I experience sound. Right. It's interesting. Cause I mean, a lot of, a lot of engineers have something else that they're into like photography or like, you know, Chad, obviously an amazing photographer, and stuff, but I don't think I've ever met anyone else who's into aromatics. Oh, they're fantastic. I mean, I'd love to show you my whole array of stuff, but I'd have to, I can't, it's in there and it's in a big, it's hard to move around. But um, yeah, and I, and I, then I really love some of these old compositions that you cannot get anymore. New Sh Shalimar smells nothing like old Shalimar. And vintage Shalimar doesn't even smell like, it, it's lost some of the, um, effervescence of its top top notes the bergamot because it's going to degrade because those are volatile so it's even darker than it was in Jacques Erlain's day but he spent a long time on Shalimar and is that recipe just like locked up somewhere no one will is this know? fascinating so perfume recipes are I guess well that they, they're actually um they're not called recipes they're called um 
oh, I just left my mind. Um, well, compositions, but um, formulas. They couldn't copyright them. Isn't that weird? They were not copyrightable. So perfume houses like Guerlain and, you know, um, uh, and Chanel and back in the heyday of all of this, they got almost like cabalist and very like people would try to steal. I mean, it was a dangerous little game trying to get people's um, and trying to get the noses, the people who made these fragrances for these uh, perfume houses. And they were getting afraid that these old um, formulas would get lost. So there's actually a museum now and a repository in France that the world has accepted as the single repository for all classic perfume formulas and Chanel, Guerlain, Lanvin, all the great perfume houses agreed to submit their formulas for their most iconic fragrances and have them archived in safety in the vaults. Of Where nobody's place. allowed to look at them. Nobody's allowed to look at them, but they're safe. Because like back in the day, Chanel number no. five, was never even known by all of the, not the scientists, they weren't called that then, but like all the people that would go into the production of the actual perfume, none of them were all allowed to know the full recipe. They would only be given certain right. you know, of the formula, certain factors of it. There was one person who knew the entire complete formula and that's Ernest Bow who created it. And there so had to be the, some like contingency plan with a copy of it in a safe. So if he got hit right. by a bus, well, like, you know what, it was, it, it was with different people. So then, then they would have part of it with this person at this, you know, here and they spread it out so that one person couldn't then get rolled and like get it stolen from them. You would have to be able to rouse two or three people, you know, outside of Ernest Bow to even know what the full recipe was. They were very, very careful with them. And there's a reason why. And how many and so, how many of the, the formulas that got submitted to this archive do you think are actually bogus because they don't trust it? I, no, I think that they do trust it. Okay. They, they want to trust it. Um, and this happened long enough ago where some of these people were still alive. You know, because again, these this wasn't, you know, 300 years ago. I think Chanel number no. five may have been 1918 1917 like they were turn of the century and this um repository uh i think may have begun in the 50s or like in other words ernest bow was still alive you know these, right. these these men were still around so i think that they were the ones that actually i may be misspeaking you could google all of this but it is basically you know no the real ones are in there the houses wanted them in there they were more afraid of them in the as the world started to grow easy access to information like it was safer for them to say we will put right these under lock and key um it's open to the public but not there are safes not there are it's like it's like the fort knox of perfume right and i suppose it's also i mean if you say it started in the 50s people don't really think about the fact that we've just been through two world wars where all kinds of shit gets destroyed exactly and there was great fear um certainly from the gear lane um, house that, you know, because they're in France, it's, it's where it's happening, yeah. um, that they would be absolutely destroyed. Chanel's um, owner, it was sold to um, something Zimmerman, I can't remember the last name. And he boogied to New York before the Nazis came with basically Chanel's, you know, cash, um, not C-A-S-H, like C-H-E of, of, so, so that um, Chanel did not get pillaged. Guerlain survived it, but truly, I mean, they, they, if you smell vintage Shalimar, it will strike you as, see, because these perfumes were created during an era when people's sexuality had to be repressed. Women were not allowed to, other than, you know, the little, you know, flapper dapper, basically sensuality was expressed and sexuality was expressed through dancing, through art. And then they realized through fragrance, when they started to discover these animal components that are very sexual in their smell, they evoke and they're evocative. You would, there's no sillage. Sillage means that which trails behind the fragrance. When you walk by some chick and she reeks like perfume and you're gagging, that's a bunch of sillage. If you wanna smell the Shalimar and I just put it on, you're still gonna have to get up to me. But boy, is it strong when you do. Right. So it doesn't have a big, Cologne sillage. It's got a very specific, tight, hot fragrance. 
So you're dancing with a woman who has to wear long sleeves and lace up boots. And it's like the 1911s or whatever. Well, you're not going to get to have sex with her that night. You're probably, you know, it's all repressed, but you sniff her neck. And inside that combination is also some musk from animals, from castor, from, you know, muskrats and shit. And so it, it evokes sexuality that, that couldn't just be out there, you know? And so in those ways, they're super evocative. They're super amazing to smell under the right circumstances. Their full power comes forth. They weren't just made to dab on for fun. They right. were meant to carry civilizations, sensuality in ways that were masked and was super powerful. It's deep, deep shit, yeah. man. I'm yeah. into it. No, it is, and because it, it's not just a, it's not about what it smells like; it's about what it feels like to smell it. Yes, exactly. See, I don't even need to wear the perfume. I put it on now so I can sniff it, but mostly I just want to smell the aromatic. But I want to put it on somebody else and smell it on them. Right. Who cares what it smells like on me? You know, I'll put it on your balls and see how they smell. <laughs> it's cool, but not some cheap spray cologne. We're talking about pure agar wood just the tiniest bit you know somewhere under your armpit and then smell that oh fuck it's amazing so how much does the person it's on affect the aroma does it at all yes yeah it does a lot i think um because you know everybody has an aroma we're a little bit blinded to that because we choose to be well you smell it all the time is, yeah yeah, and it's not just about body odor. It's just about what is the natural smell of sweat. Okay, before it gets rank and bacteria embedded and then has an actual stinky, you know, cat box, but like sweat has a, has a, you know, it, there's a little, it's like a musky smell, but it's also almost like a, it's almost a yeasty smell. It's not very pleasant, but, you know, everybody's is a little bit different. And so that will change the nature of perfume a great deal, I think. But to me, it's how it's used when you're going to like, it's, to me, it's anointing. It's used as a sacrificial, not sacrifice. Yeah, I, uh, sacred anointing liquid that I use for very specific purposes. I don't walk around smelling like Shalimar. I don't wear Shalimar unless it's very special. I certainly don't open my deer musk unless it's real special time. Um, they're meant to be sacred and and be part of sacred shit. I get into sacred shit. I get into like weird magic shit. I don't I don't believe in magic. I just believe in what these things do to my body. Right. And they do something. They do something to it. When it's not just loaded on to try to like gag everybody in the room. Mm. I wish you could <laughs> smell it right now. It's so rich. <sighs> and anyway, it it's sexual. Everything for me is sexual. You might as well know it. Kind well, and it's also, I'm trying to think, it, it may be one of the very few things that humans experience where there cannot be yet a digital version of it. Nope. There can be, you can put that Shalimar right there into a, I guess, a Spectron, you know, yeah. whatever those things are that show what chemical composites are. Yeah. And they can tell you exactly what's in it. And they can even tell you to a certain degree how much but they cannot tell you exactly and it's in that nuance of not knowing the exactitude that they cannot replicate Shalimar without the exact formula which is hidden from the world yeah well it's also the the human sense of smell is not understood at all and there mm -hmm. uh, there was a great bbc program about this uh, a few years ago uh hosted by jim al khalili do you know him Mm -hmm. a really brilliant he's he's a quantum biologist basically and yeah. what it was th the point of it was that everybody's thought that the way you smell has something to do with the shape of the molecule and so that goes into your senses the, the sensory organs for smell and the way it hooks in is how you smell things but then there's the cyanide smells like apples and those molecules right. have nothing to do with each other. And they're starting to understand that it's all quantum biology is how you smell, but they have no idea how it works. Absolutely and, no idea. And the fact that smell happens first after your nose, a sight goes immediately into your occipital lobe in your brain. Smell goes first to your limbic region. 
it is experienced first in your limbic region, which is your emotional. Yeah. Well, and sound no, takes a detour other... there too, just in case yes. like you need to run. But it doesn't go there first, interestingly. But but from what I understand, olfactory first hits limbic, then into your brain. Right. I think sound. Well, as Susan, I don't know. As Susan described it, I think it, I don't remember if it's first or if it's a why directly from the auditory nerve. Why. But it's like there's shit that you might need to react to with your old right. brain before you've got time to process anything with the new exactly. brain. Exactly. And scent and sound are both of them. So we react. Yeah. I react so emotionally to aromatics the same way I do to sound. I, I'm a very limbic driven. I never grew out of my limbic region. It, it, it still rules the roost. And that must be why music has always been associated with air smells to me for as long as I can remember. I, I do not separate the two. Um, and, and then imagination, you know, just takes it all away. Yeah. Well, shit. Well, shit. Let's do some Q and A. Let's do some Q and A. Let's do some Q and A. That's it. Mark, get your ass in here for some q and I think he's still recovering from looking at your tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not shy. I mean, underwear, underwear. People go to the beach and they see a lot more. I, you know. People watch porn and see more than that. Yeah, it's pretty standard. I'm a standard <laughs> chick with a standard body with an amazing, awesome start of my tattoo. And I, I never, I have no other tattoos. So this, I mean, this is five sessions. It's pretty elaborate, this horse, but I really dig it. I love the guy who's doing it. Pete, he's fabulous. I have kind of like, you get a crush on your tattoo guy. Can't help it. He's super peaceful and uh, I love his work. So I had to wait a long time to get in, a, get in with him. But now he said he'll do my whole legs. It's, it's pretty impressive, the shading. Cause I mean, there's no color, right? It's No, it's all just done in grayscale, except yeah. for the little lamps on my lightning bugs have a uh, little bit, I mean, they have a little bit of yellow. I didn't see that. <laughs> Nice. Well, that's real subtle. He's just a grayscale guy. He doesn't do color. I don't want color. I just want the grayscale. Yeah, it feels very three-dimensional. It's beautiful. I really like it. So do you want to talk about horse rescue a little bit while we wait for Mark? Because that's another one of your your things. Yeah, right? I mean, I love horses. I don't own any of the horses I ride. And the people who do own them, well, the one lady rescues many, many. It's not like... She would rescue a horse in need in a minute, but what she mostly does is takes in older horses that other people, you know, are trying to get rid of and makes sure that they have a wonderful life for the rest of their life. So, you know, a lot of her horses are old. I mean, Junior, who I don't ride so much anymore. I mean, he's 32 years old and he's still a great ride. That's why I don't actually ride him because wow. he's still too much horse for me. Now, I'm, I'm really ignorant. What is normal lifespan for a horse? You know, 30, 35 is a very, is an old horse, but that's not unheard of. Right. I think I've read somewhere the whole oldest horse that anybody has been verified might have been like 46. That's extremely old. Right. You know, when they're in their 30s, there would be equivalent to our person in our 80s, I guess. So, right. but yeah, like a, a middle aged horse is around 18. You know, that's a, that's a young, that's, you know, like a young, a young horse, but not a baby horse. So horses bring you smells and sounds and peace into your mind. You have to be still when you're around horses. I can't think like this when I'm around horses. I have to shut this off or I'll get killed or hurt. So horses are one of the few places where this constant shit is not firing in my brain and I calm down and I'm silent. Right. And I just try to be where the horse is because I have to, sometimes this has to shut off or I'll go crazy. And horses really help me do that. Right. Interesting. So it's yeah. your meditation. Yes. And even though I'm sweating and it's hot and I, you know, I'm having to focus very hard on what the horse needs and what the horse is doing. I'm not, there's none of my imagination or none of my, right. The fantasy part of my being, which is a, again, a, a very large part of my existence it has to shut off. Well, and that's, that's the definition of mindfulness. You know, you can't right. be more in the moment than that. Right. Exactly. And, um, and I do struggle to be in the moment. Although, although I'm, I'm not out of the moment, I'm not like 
up there on social media, looking at what other people are doing. Like my imagination is very much part of the moment I'm in too, but I'm often trying to create a dialogue or a narrative. So when I'm with a horse, I can't let myself do those things. Right. I had to be quiet in my mind and literally, but see that a new narrative pops up, which is, yeah, it's just me out in the wilderness and I'm checking my fence line. I'm not, <laughs> I'm on wood acres in a perfectly safe 20 acre horse farm. But instead I'm like, no man, I'm out here alone. And with my, and I'm watching the horizon and Indians might like, and anything could happen now. A coyote could fly up. Canadians, or a, could, a Canadians, Canadians <laughs> could show up in the deep South, man. They won't know what to do. Now do you give the horses They'll, personality and voices? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, horses. sir. Like the horse yes. on Ren and Stimpy, right? <laughs> well, the horses call me apple pants to begin with. Apple pants. Yeah. And they came up with that because your well, pants are full of essentially, apples. Yes. Yeah. Well, Junior, he loved me. He's the Mick Jagger of horses because he's got big lips and he loves to lick my arms. Um, there's salt on my arms and he's just a lover. He likes Altoids. He likes LaCroix and he loves apples, but he's sachets. He's a Tennessee walking horse. and He's got kind of a little sachet when he walks. He's a little bit of a swagger and really big lips. So I like to think of him as the Mick Jagger of horses. He's Jagger. Um, Rufus is who's on my thigh. You know, he's just, he's, I want, I, I, the horses are, the horses, I have anthropomorphized to the point where they are human in their nature, even though I know exactly what a horse nature is, and it is not human. And they don't think I'm a horse and they, they just love me because I bring them food and I'm good to them. But to me, they have become personalities that, you know, are my friends. And we talk about a lot of stuff. I read them the book. They listen to mixes. We listened to a lot of uh, Holly Holy Love by Neil Diamond, which is my newest obsession song. Wow. I get obsessed on a song and I only want to hear it. Well, can I, can I, because just when you got back from your last break, I was just showing everybody, my video's reversed because otherwise it streams wrong, but this is a clock that I got from Neil Diamond. For, <gasps> for oh Christmas. my God. Yeah. That is I, absolutely gorgeous. I could swap my video, but I have to go into the preferences and things. No, I can, I can, but, I got, I got yeah. picking that up. But it's really you got nice. That from Neil Diamond. Yeah. Do you still know that guy? Not really. I mean, I, I worked on a couple records, you know, the ones that Rick did. I worked on those and hung out with him a lot during those and got some amazing stories. Absolutely amazing stories. But um, no, I haven't really talked to him since. Which is, for Hello. me, that's what it always is. I'm always like really tight with people as I make records and I yeah. almost never talk to him after. Me too. It's just a weird well, thing. He's written a lot of really great stuff, but the fact is Holly Holy Love, that's one of the best songs ever written in the history of songs, period, in my opinion. So that shit is so good. Story with him. This is why this is why it's so solidified in my mind, this break with the Beatles when the Beatles hit the States and A&R changed because he was a writer. And he just showed up every morning, went to the Brill building with a song and went publisher to publisher, sold them. The day they played Ed Sullivan, it was all over. And he was like, fuck. I, and someone I'm talked him into being an artist. He, wasn't, he didn't want to sing. He didn't want to do any of that. He just was writing songs. He, well, and he would go to, he was like a fill-in on the Philadelphia like dance shows, the television shows on, on Sundays. It's so like he'd have to go all over town doing that. But, but as a writer, he did not, he never even thought about being an artist. Like that was not well, a thing. I'm damn glad he did because nobody can deliver except for if I give it to ever and he sings it to me in my mind, Holly, Holy love like Neil Diamond does, especially just the groove at the front. Listen to it again. Just I'll have to. I've mind. never heard that in years. Oh, it, you will shit that groove up in the front, which is the acoustic guitar and the piano. Dum, boom, boom, dum, boom, boom. Hallelujah. Now, could he and sing that so, into your mouth? Yeah, Neil Young could, but I would prefer if Paul Rogers sang it into my mouth or Taj Mahal. I like their voices a little bit better than okay. Neil Young. I do like his voice, but I would like to give that song to Greg Allman if he could be alive again and he could sing Holly Holy Love into my mouth. That would make me happy. Right. Okay. I could die after that. 
That would be as long it. as my son is secure and has some money and he's like happy, he wouldn't miss his mom. Right. And my husband too, I wouldn't want him to miss me. But no. if Greg Allman came back from the dead, <laughs> or Otis Redding, of course, um, or Sam Cooke, and got up and and mal uh, and malfucked me with Holly Holy Love, holy shit! So you'd be okay with the cover? That's interesting. Like you'd want totally. that voice, but that song. Yes, exactly. That's it. That's like yeah. that's the thing. And this is where my fantasy is so great. My hero does both. He's the voice and the song I want to give him. There you go. <laughs> it's so fun to make up your own love. <laughs> well, if it isn't perfect, then why are you bothering to make it up? Exactly. So. I already have the imperfect version and I'm happy as shit. Not just <laughs> even happier now. And in generally in a much better mood. Excellent. Hi, everybody. How are we doing out there? How Good. Do I, how Mark, do makeup? get in ah. here. Mark, Mark, Mark. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Oh, hey, Mark. To take care of it. Hey. Hi, Mark. Hey. hey, I didn't see you guys there. How are you doing? <laughs> so do we keep any of Pretty our good. viewers or do they all bail? Uh, I think the viewer numbers have gone up. Oh, <laughs> substantially. the tattoo when I took my pants yeah. off? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. you know, funny thing. <laughs> Crazy. All right. All questions. right. This has been amazing. And yes, we have questions. A lot of questions. All right. Um, <laughs> Canadians on their savage combat mooses, says Martin Gallup. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, so, first question uh, most upvoted on Crowdcast What's Bruce's favorite recording mic? <laughs> I never recorded Bruce's voice. So, I don't know because Bruce would come in and play guitar on. Uh, Patty's records, or he'd play like a little B3. He would he would add overdubs, but I never recorded his voice. I'll tell you what, people should go back to, I think it was in part one with Bob Claremountain, because he talked about recording some Bruce. I think he said a 47 back then, but I could be Yeah, or, or Brendan O'Brien, he did some. Uh... Well, I haven't interviewed Brendan, so I can't point people to a specific interview. So oh. that's all. Well, that's his loss. He's probably too busy just, you know, making records. Fishing. Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. Hey, um, I don't know. I can't answer that. I'm sorry. But I did get to ride in his coffee colored Cadillac, which he actually owns. A coffee colored Cadillac, which cracked me up. <laughs> anyway. Amazing. All right. Next question. Uh, that was from Gabriel. Sorry. Uh, so our next question is from Darren. And he says Hi, Trina. You're a no bullshit type of person, but is there a piece of no bullshit gear that you couldn't live without? Andrew, hi, I'm a local boy and we have a mutual friend who's currently renovating a house nearby. I'm a scaffolder. Uh, when can the three of us meet up for a few beers and chew the cud over vintage tractors, vintage gear, and vintage beer? Um, this is definitely the place to answer, Darren. This is, <laughs> this is a man who I believe collects old synths. Like that's oh. his thing because uh, my friend was was telling <laughs> yes. me about him and I am supposed to go meet him. But unfortunately, there is a pandemic that kills people. So I'm not meeting anybody at the moment. But that Did will happen. Did you get vaccinated yet? I've, I am double vaccinated. And then India decided to have a new version based on our oh, version. Yeah. And it's all it's very difficult. Yes. And, and it's a drag. But yes, I'm vaccinated. I, I have my privilege that I live with and I'm happy with that part of it. Yes. I cannot live without, um, well, API mm -hmm. 512 preamps and either a 550A, a 550B, or a 560EQ. I need API preamplification and equalization to survive my life. Would Neve, you, too. Would you pick a favorite of those EQs? Yeah, 550B. I think that shit is smoking hot. Good yes. see, and for all the vintage heads, they go, no man, the A is earlier. You got well, yeah, you know what I got though that's better than all of them A's. I got a 550 out of one of the very first API boards that they ever made, and I know it because I sent it to them, and they're like, wow, this is this is one of our very early 550 A's, and it doesn't even sound it's 550s, and it doesn't even sound like a 550A. It sounds better than that. However. In day-to-day -day use, I, the extra band really comes in handy for me. And so I get more use out of my 550B, but nothing sounds like that 550. It's amazing. Wow. And they even said so too. And it won't light up in the uh, lunchbox because it's only wired to light up if it's in a console. And they said, don't change that wiring. So just, it works, but obviously your light doesn't work. Only if it's in an actual console, not a lunchbox. Right. 
the old consoles were wired differently for their lights than the lunch boxes. So anyway, but yeah, API, you know, API and Neve are equal in terms of me not surviving without them. I mean, and enjoying what I do. All right. Andrew. Oh, what I'm supposed to answer to that too? Yeah, let's yes. answer that as well. So for tracking, mm -hmm. I'd go uh, 1073 for the preamp and the EQ. Yeah, hell yeah. I'll go there too. Yeah. I'm changing my order. I want a 1073. <laughs> <laughs> Well, awesome. they're so different. There aren't that many people who are Neve and API kids. You know what I mean? Because they're just totally different beasts. I know, but one's clicks and one's like not, you know, is I, I need both of the yeah. no, they're they're you need them both. They're like they're like salt and pepper. Yeah, see like I Rufus I, and Shaka Khan, man. I if I had to just pick one, I'd definitely pick the Neve. I could like I could survive without the API, whereas surviving without the Neve would be more difficult for tracking for me. I just because I, I know the Neve so much better. We, yeah, I guess if we split them up, I couldn't live without Neve either. You know what? I think that I'd even die first without Neve everywhere. I'm voting for Neve too. I'm sorry, API, I love you. That's fine. Don't and get me and wrong. talking about the, you know, oh, the earlier is always better thing. Who was it we were talking to, Mark? And and Rupert and Eve had said, like, why do you guys like the old yes. shit? I'm so much yeah. better at designing gear now. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I'll tell you what. The why Rupert is the 1073 the one? The 600 series for the 500 series racks, those things are amazing. I yeah. love them. His new EQs. Yeah. What are these things called again? They're called? The 5052s? 5051. Mm. Those are some of the best sounding EQs I've heard since old Neves. Rupert doesn't get it though. He's old. He's lot. He he figured out five point six, not five point five, or five point mm. seven, five point six. You know what I mean? Like he yeah. figured out. Isn't it eight point one, not eight or seven point nine? Well, and as far as I know. A lot of those frequencies were chosen by the people who ordered the first console that had them in them. It's why there's so many different versions of the EQs. Because like the BBC would say, yeah, but we're not having those frequencies. We want these. And so like Abbey Road wow. defined frequencies on one of the versions. That. As wow. far as I know. And it's why there's so many weird little variations. Because like there's, a, there's the 1073 and then there's a 1078, which just has an extra frequency. It's got 10K in the mid band. Right which is what yeah. we modeled for the, the plugin I did. And it's amazing having that bell up at 10K. You know, it's, it was all just, I think, yeah, it's what people wanted, but he, he gets better at making EQs now. And, and I get that. And they work, they, they, they don't crackle and stuff. They work great, but it's, they're just, he's missing the sex appeal of the old stuff that we just want it. Yeah. We just want to. Well, and because. also, I mean, you know, choosing the center frequencies obviously is a big deal, but just the shape of things is fucking great. So, well, EQs are still mysterious to me, even though I know that they're to, parametrically. To the man himself, rest in peace. I know. All right. There's awesome. nobody named like Bobby API, unfortunately. No, there's not. Nope. Like, do we know, is there a designer, an original API designer that we know the name of? Am I hmm. ignorant? Is this a thing? I don't know. I'm going to go back and read because it's automated processes, Inc. I think that it was may have been more collaborative than just like good old Rupert Neve. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I do love them, though. All right. They moving on. Moving me. on. Sorry. We hijacked right. that one. Awesome. There's a lot of moose chat going on on Crowdcast right now. Moose chat. What's like moose Canadian, chat? Canadian moose, moose chat. chat. Are, yeah, are, are the upset. Canadians upset because it seems like I've painted them in some kind of like demon spawn and they're not, they're not. Well, I love Canadians. They're, it's mostly just about the moose. Um, don't forget that a moose can stop a car. Uh, yeah. I met a moose in the road in the Tetons. They're huge. They are huge. Moose are essentially big beefs on stilts or mooses. Moose eye. So they're talking amongst themselves. We have no more questions. They've got some moose stuff going on. No, we do. Okay. Our next one is from Tim. And Tim says, do you have a favorite set of monitors and or ones that you carry with you everywhere? Um, I do have a favorite set of monitors and they are the Genelec uh, 8350s. Wait, 8351s. <laughs> what are they? Here, hang on. 
those, oh, you know, yeah. the SAM monitors. Um, they are absolutely breathtaking. They are the Shalimar of speakers. Um, I adore them. They were provided to me by Genelec and because I could never have afforded them. And they are the best monitors I've ever heard. And I don't travel to mix, so they don't go anywhere with me. I, I don't travel with those. Um, they sit right exactly where they are. And I love them. I better look up and make sure I got that number right. I haven't said it in a while. I think it's 8351. Carry on. All right. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go with our next one is from DJ Wilkins. And DJ asks, have you had any feedback after your interview on NPR where you were introduced as a trailblazer and an inspiration for women? My wife is inspired by your story. The Genelex are 8351, by the way. Um, nice. Well, I, I, I got a lot. I, I don't look at social media, so I think there was quite a lot of, of um, you know, praise on social media, but I didn't see it. So I've, I didn't cringe when I listened to it, and that made me happy. I mean, I was like, all right, all right, I can deal with that. Um, my close friends were all really happy about it. I did not hear from any, like, a cod, you know, a, a bunch of women who were, you know, I got a little bit of feedback. Um, I don't think that I'm that inspiring to women. I think I got more feedback just from engineers, you know, who, who were interested in. And then I got some feedback from some people who I hadn't heard from in a really long time that heard it. Um, but that was just really fun to do. And I was honored to do it. But I mean, I think if I went and looked at social media, there was probably more than I realized. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, okay, so I'm just going through some YouTube comments here. Uh, so Bob Studio uh, says, I have a question for you, Trina. Are you of the same thinking that you're overthinking 150% of your music stuff? I, I don't know because I overthink everything. So it's all a big giant overthinking, you know, miasma. So um, did that answer? Is that what he asked me? Am I yeah. overthinking? Yeah. Uh, wanna, yeah. Yep. If you're. Yeah, but I got nothing else to think about. So I got to overthink because I'm stuck in here for 10 or 15 hours a day. So mm -hmm. I overthink everything. Yeah. Um, and I also underthink it because the song determines everything. And then I just follow the song around, but I give, yeah, I, I don't operate in the world like average people. I think I have like spectrum stuff. So I don't know how to answer that. I overthink everything. And are you actually working those kinds of hours regularly? Yeah, but not in a block form. I'm in and out of my studio 24 seven. In other words, I'll come in at five in the morning and work for three hours and then go do whatever else I gotta do come back like I, I can it's I, I I'm never not in here or I'm in here working and I'm working on the book in other words I'm right I'm, I'm just constantly in this room doing something uh, a great deal of time and I still work very very long hours to generate enough income to survive yes right mm -hmm. awesome okay uh next question is from wigmaster and uh so we might have covered this in part one, but uh, he says, can Trina talk about where will I be and all my tears uh, be washed away in parentheses from Wrecking Ball? Well, where will I be? Um, the drum kit was a Yamaha, regular old Yamaha drum kit. And he was set up in the guitar room at Kingsway, which was just one of the parlors. And it was Brian Blade. And Dan was playing electric mandolin which was kind of a new instrument. Um, now it's pretty popular, but we had never heard of it before. And maybe it was even made for him or something. Um, and he had the part. And, you know, he, he had the song written. He wanted Emmy to, of course, sing it because it was for her record um, or she was covering it. And um, Emmy was having a real hard time finding where the one comes in versus just knowing because so the pattern's strange. Well, the streets are cracked. That's the one cracked, you know, not well, the streets are, that's just a pickup, right? And we could all hear that in this pattern, but Emmy could not. 
So the basic track was kind of laid down and he was trying to get Emmy to come in, you know, where she's supposed to come in. Well, the streets cracked, there's the one. But Emmy could not internalize that. So she kept coming in on the one with, well, the streets are, which of course throws the whole lyric and melody off of the, of the chord progression on the electric mandolin. And I can remember Dan, you know, finally at the end of it, just feeling like being really angry and kind of, kind of over the top, you know, pissed off that she could not understand where the one was. And I, I, I seemed to find a way to help her understand where to come in so that she could find the one. And once we got through that, she started singing it really beautifully like you hear on the record. And I already told that story about missing my bass on mute because we're mixing on the board and everybody had their jobs to do. And I had, you know, fingers already on the bass track. You have to have them already depressed. So you're just lifting up. You're not pressing down and then letting them come up because it'll crackle. Fingers are already on there, but I missed the entrance that Dan, where he wanted the bass unmuted. But instead of panicking and just lifting my fingers, I waited till I knew he was going to do this boom, 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 boom. And I made that one and it didn't crackle. And he was angry that I missed where I was supposed to unmute the bass, but then real happy because it was musical where I did unmute it. And then that ended up on the record and it made me proud. Mm. If you listen to it, you'll hear That's exactly awesome. what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's, awesome. Yeah, we didn't talk about that first time. That's interesting. Oh, yeah, it's really, it was a great, well, I was terrified because you got yelled at a lot if you missed your, you know, remember when we mixed it, there was no automation, you, everybody yeah. had jobs, you know, and the, the console's all marked with tape and, you know, there's just stuff everywhere and there was no lights on the API uh, IO channels. They, they didn't have on and off lights there. So you, um, you know, you had to mark aux, like whatever, things, little pieces of tape to, so you could move fast, aux one on, aux one off, you know, mutes all crackled so they had to be depressed and you held them in the whole mix until it was time mm. to let them up otherwise you were sure to get a crackle so it was in big you, you would sweat during a mix i mean it was so uh physical binding with the song and the reverb was from a, a pcm 70 and uh just like i got sitting right here uh large room but i remember the exact um Large hall, rather, the exact reverb settings, 22 millisecond pre-delay, just in case you wanted. <laughs> you did mention the 22 second millisecond, yeah, 22 second pre-delay. That's what we need. That'd be that. awesome. I'm going <laughs> to get great. a sandwich. It's in the next song. I, got, yeah, I turned the reverb on. It's just taking a while to get back. From, yeah, it'll be, it'll be there you know? any minute. And I mean, and that's got to be doubly hard because, I mean, you'd said that you and Dan were not in the best place during the rest of that record either so it's uh yeah that's that's a contentious thing to be having to work so closely and have it be real time and not because you can't stay out of his yeah. way when it's manual mixing and things. well the blowout with him happened after that song got mixed. okay that's first see remember we tracked a song in the morning overdubbed it in the afternoon and mixed it that night right there wasn't any okay now the mix session begins the song was done the next morning it came in everybody listened again maybe a couple more prints were made and then I had to do recalls with giant VHS cameras on my shoulder filming the console. Um, but mostly once that thing came off the board, it was time to move on to the next song. So that record was recorded. And that song was done before we had our big falling out. Right. You know, so that happened dur during going back to Harlan. I'm going back to Harlan. That's a good song. All cool. Right. Is anybody yeah. else asking awesome. a question? Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, Bass Vandriel asks, who would you love to work with and haven't yet? Yeah, they're all dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> they are. I mean, I don't I, I, it's hard for me to answer that because I don't really care about the artists. I care about the songs. Which song do I want to get to work with? And I just something stunning, something game changer song, something as good as Holly Holy Love, something as good as Can't You Hear Me Knocking, something, I mean, people will say, well, this song, and you know, this song's as good as that contemporary. Well, that's their contemporaries. Everything I care about's already been recorded. So no, anybody who can sing, who can sing right now? Who's a popular 
current person who can sing their ass off. Amy Winehouse, but she died. Well, yeah, she's not even that current though anymore. Uh, no, probably Phoebe Name Bridges somebody. a little bit. Mm. Um, who else? I don't know who that is. She's good. Uh, Adrian Lenker from Big Thief. It's a it really interesting voice. Don't know who that is. You see that I'm I'm out of the current. and I'm completely out of the loop too. I just happen yeah. to know those two, so, so I look in order to like answer I know your question, something. Um, nobody. I'll work with anybody who's got a hundred bucks an hour and can sing. <laughs> That's where I am right now. Everything else. Or 200 bucks an hour and they can't sing. <laughs> yeah, you can't sing $200 an hour. <laughs> um, and, and how much not to mix, good... you couldn't afford it. The Who's got the, the most Brothers? outrageous rhythm hand that still lives today? Who plays the guitar better than anybody? Is it still Billy? Oh, Billy Gibbons. Billy Gibbons. Sorry. Mm. Billy Sorry, Gibbons. I want there to record go. Billy Gibbons. Okay. Do you I, know him? I just mis mixed a record for him that's coming out Will you tell like him in I a couple of weeks. And I want him to voice fuck me too. Well, so no, I didn't actually get to get to talk to him directly, but I will pass that message along that you Please would. Please do. Like. And if he doesn't mind, I'd like it to be sure got cold after the rain came. I might not mention the voice fuck thing because there's a lot of backstory that has to go into that. Okay. He'll just think that's weird. It, well... Yeah, I mean, coming yeah, from yeah, me, okay. like secondhand the through someone else, <laughs> it it's hard to get okay. across in an email, you know. Right. Well, just tell them there's this woman who's an engineer that you should probably know needs some stuff from you that she's willing to pay a thousand dollars for, and it's not your dick. <laughs> okay. No, I can't even go there, man. You can't. Leave okay, you can't. Either. Is he like a respectful dude? He he he's not crass and like. I me. don't. I have not met the man, unfortunately. Okay, so, so your client. Yeah. As you far as really I know, respectful. yes. As far okay. as I know, he's a very thoughtful, badass individual. I want to record his rhythm hand, really badly. So that's what I want. All right. Billy well, Gibbons, if... I want to record Billy Gibbons playing guitar. Not even for a record. Fuck that. I just want to get in a room with him. Well, have him guest on something you're doing when it can come up. Well, who who am I going to get to have Billy Gibbons play on? It's got to be somebody. I know, but who's I don't know him. Who's he going to agree to play on? I don't know. You got to ask him for me. Come <laughs> on. All right, I'll see now, what I, I, would love to record, I would love to record <laughs> Billy Gibbons' voice and guitar. Thank you. I got to say, like, I mean, obviously his guitar playing on this record is great, but man, his voice, it's still just mesmerizing. See how much cooler you are than I am? I this doesn't make me cool. You. That doesn't make me cool at really? all. Doesn't, you get to record Billy you get I to didn't get to record. Billy Gibbons. I didn't get to record it at all. I just, I got to mix it, which I'm very, very happy about. Well, just the same difference. So you got to mix Billy Gibbons. I'm not mixing Billy Gibbons. And it's Billy so F. Gibbons. Billy fucking Gibbons. Exactly. And he is one of my heroes. And he also, so that makes you cooler than me. I want you to be Soon cooler to than me. to be Billy V. F. Gibbons. Boys fuck me Gibbons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> VFM. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I'm sorry, people. What's the next question? Yeah. Okay. Next question is from Dave Westner. Uh, Dave asks, is Trina mostly mixing or recording these days or both roughly equal? Mixing. Awesome. I'm working on one awesome. production right now. I haven't done a production other than the one I'm working on for a long time. Yeah. Uh, is that pandemic related or mm -mm. Uh, just in general? It's just where yeah. the money comes in. Mm -hmm. And a follow-up question to that from Rez is, I'm wondering uh, which you prefer, which one would you prefer to do as well, uh, mixing or producing? I, would, I, I I love mixing. That is my the highest form of the art as far as I'm concerned. I've gone through that before. Mixing is the culmination of everything. Mm. I do love producing when it is the artist that I adore, songs that I adore, a situation that we are free to just do what we want to do. And there is no pressure from any, any other entity trying to boss us around. Then I will produce mm then there's nothing better than producing. But if it's going to be interfered with or a tight schedule or a low budget where we can't really work and I can't get into a cool room, I'd rather just mix. Awesome. Okay. Uh, this is a quick one. <laughs> this is from Sonny Greenwich Jr. Is that Ted Neely's pick behind Drina? Yeah, darling. Yes. 
There he is, one of the most stellar voices ever. And Carl Anderson. Ted, Rest his VFM, soul. Neely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Carl Anderson was, of course, Judas. And so they were both like, I, they blew my mind. I was seven years old and it changed my life forever. Hearing those two men sing, holy shit, that whole thing. I just never, I can't ever get over it. I mean, it's, he's, it, he ha, I wear his t-shirt around town. I adore him, Ted Neely. How could I not have said that? I forgot who I wanted to record, Ted Neely. If you're out there, Ted, you got a girl right here that's been loving you for 50 years. <laughs> 50 years I've loved that man's voice. 50 years. Carl Anderson died, though. I loved his actually even a little bit more. Well, I love Ted Neely. Don't tell Ted that, though. Ted knows that. <laughs> anyway, I've never met Ted Neely. I've never been in a room when he opened his mouth. He could definitely voice fuck me. <laughs> I pay him five thousand. <laughs> that gross. You people got the wrong impression of me. It's just sensual. It's like mm. breastfeeding. It's got nothing to do with actual sexual intercourse. It has to do with communing with something that changes my life, which is the st the sound of people's voice. Yeah, I'm overthinking it, motherfucker. For the guy who asked that. <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, so. There were a couple of suggestions for for artists in here, so I'm just going to quick fire these, and then you can you can give them a uh, a yes, a V uh, VFM, or a no. What does VFM stand for? I forgot. Voice fuck me. Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry, that one. <laughs> what does it stand for? I was for? making sure it wasn't like voltage okay. frequency. Modular. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here yeah. we go. Uh, Michael My Jackson. Asthma. I had a huge crush on Michael Jackson when I was a kid and he was like, you know, Michael Jackson. And I even got to go see, check this out. I got to go to the dancing machine tour at the mill run theater when I was nine years old, saw the Jackson five for the dancing machine tour, wow. dancing, 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 but I wouldn't want him to voice fuck me. I love him, mm. but he did not have the voice that I need. I'll tell you who did Tito. Low. Carry on. All right. Uh, Chris Stapleton. He's wonderful, but I, I, I haven't really heard his music, so I've got to confess that. I, I know he's real good, and I know I heard one song and was like, yep, badass, but um, no. I Is he that good of a singer? What do you guys think? Pretty, Maybe? Pretty good singer. Pretty good yeah, singer? Yeah, I mean, and there are a lot of people who feel like, holy shit especially well, if you're in the felt, room with him it's very they, powerful yeah they fell in yeah. love with him during a moment of like when i fell in love with ted neely right okay so they bonded with him during this moment of high emotion so chris stapleton walked into this room right now grabbed a guitar started playing and opened his mouth and his voice did the thing hell yes <laughs> but i just i don't i don't listen i didn't listen to his records i i'm gonna get some and i'll let you know on that all right there you go Okay, all right. To be continued on Chris Stapleton. Uh, there's a suggestion. Loren is an unknown excellent singer. So there you go. Uh, right. Next one for the question is Niall Rogers. Oh, this might have been more of a. Isn't he? We might a... be moving into guitar. Well, Niall Rogers is chic yeah. and produced the Bowie record with Let's Dance. And I, I don't think he'd be a, nah, for the voice. Yeah, probably thing. not. Probably not nah. for the voice. And he though. wasn't. He wasn't uh, the voice on those records anyway. Okay, I Luther think we Vandross. moved into uh, guitar guitar players the with the strong rhythm hand at this point. This All right, but I want it to feel like Ronnie Wood. Ronnie Wood's got one of the strongest rhythm hands, in my opinion, that's ever existed. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So for strong rhythm hands, it was Nile Rogers and somebody suggested Edge. Edge, yeah, but Edge is a little bit, you know, I, I, I guess Ron Wood really sums it up for me in terms of a rhythm hand. Sexy rhythm hand. Edge is great though. But he's less sexy and more cerebral. It's more emotionally great than mm -hmm. like Billy Gibbs and Scott, the raw, just that thing. I guess I'm more of a blues rooted chick, ultimately. I must be. Yeah. Can I just, awesome. I'm going to bring up something random, but it has to do with Edge, which was uh, I was listening to, he's got a podcast and he was interviewing Flea and they were just talking about stuff, but, and, Flea asked him something, and I can't remember exactly what the context was, but Edge pointed out that he's been in a band that basically since high school that has never 
had a personnel change. Yep. Which is kind of fucked up for any band that's been around that long. There's always one revolving door. Drummers, guitar yeah. player, like whatever. Like Chili Peppers, it's guitar player. I've had a few drummers. Not a single change. Never augmented, ne- nothing. Just those four dudes since they were too young to drive. And nobody yeah. even died. Yeah. You know, right. because, you know, because that could force a, a... Well, exactly. You know, I'll bet, well, I bet they all shared the wealth evenly. Um, so there wasn't ever any this person got everything and I got nothing. Um, so they must've just shared the money, shared everything, grew up poor, were friends to start with. Yeah. Why change it? Well, Radiohead, exactly the same thing. As far mm-hmm. as I yeah. know, they were always equal on everything and they've all yeah. been there the whole time. Like, there is the key right there. You make it equal mm-hmm. where the where the one person or the two people aren't reaping all the rewards and the rest of the band feels dispensable because they mm-hmm. are in that case. But not if everybody's an owner. No. And plus, U2 is pretty good. <laughs> Just okay. kidding. I adore them. Bono can voice fuck me. All right. He won't, though. He's a good man. He's a, 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 I think Bono is like a pretty spiritual man. I think he'd think that was really weird. <laughs> well, but he sings all his vocals in the control room. So you could just kind of got to check the mic. Yeah, you could no, sneak it. No, but the difference would be that he wouldn't be doing it with the intent that I am intentionally singing my song into this woman's mm. mouth from two inches away. You don't think you could turn it into that, like mid-take? I think you could turn it into that. I, the microphone would be in the way. Mm. <laughs> Here we are again. <laughs> you are going to need to read my book yeah. if you want to figure out this voice fucking thing. All right. All right. Sorry, people. Awesome. we got to keep it fun. Okay. Otherwise, it's All just right. gear talk. Ooh. Now the chat's contributing onto this. So we've got a couple chat? more submissions. No, the chat. No, chat. Yeah. Oh, all right. Uh, Robert Smith. Who? Robert Smith. I don't know who that is. Okay. Uh, next one, Robert Plant. Nah, it's not. He's a little bit too high up there for me. Chris Cornell. Lo- Black hole, sir. Won't you come? That's he had a good guy. voice. Yeah, don't give him yeah. an underbite, though. That's not fair. Yeah. You gave him a little uh, creed action there. You did. No, he was never it was never on my real radar, but I'm not opposed to some sound garden or whatever he was in. Sound garden, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna pass on Chris Cornell, although I do like his voice and it is a baritone. Yeah. All right, while we're on the Roberts, what about Robert Palmer? Hmm. Sneaking Sally through the alley. He wrote one of the best he wrote one of my favorite songs I've ever ever had called Woke Up Laughing. Right. But no, his voice does not. Again, he's a magnificent singer, but it doesn't do the thing where my throat actually starts to like sweat. Yeah. The singer from The Killers. I have no idea who that is. Okay. Sorry. Uh, and I think that is the end of the list. Okay, you know, I'd just fine. be naming singers. So. Oh, Barry White. Somebody just entered Barry White. Hell yeah. Luther Vandross. Yeah. Any of those dudes. Yeah. Any of them. Yeah. Basically, any great black soul singer gets first dibs. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And then Ted Neely would be right there with them and Greg Alden that he did. <laughs> and Paul Rogers is alive. Let's not forget Paul. Paul is actually one of the leaders of the crooks. And so is Billy. Rod, too. All of them. I like chicks, too. Don't get me wrong. But, well, but you know. there are very few baritones in the female right. game. Mm. Yeah. It's, you know, it's just. A... Maybe Staples. Yeah, I'll but, give it up for me. But it, it's a voice yeah. box thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, it is a voice box thing. It is. I got a real low voice too. Awesome, uh, <laughs> Trina. What is? Uh, let's just post your website for anybody who's uh, interested in reaching out to you. There, you have a uh, site here, right? Yeah, yeah. it's trinashoemaker.com. I think it's up to date. You can. I do answer my contact forms, by the way. If you go there, I I I get them. They don't go to somebody else. Yeah. I get some weird. I'm gonna post that up in the chat, so you guys can uh, stay up to date with when her novel comes out. Yes. And check out all of her stuff. So I'm gonna put the button up right now in Crowdcast, guys. Yeah, and the and the playlists too. If you yes, you reposted those this time. Oh yeah, yeah you have those. Well, yeah. there they are. There you, you still they haven't changed. <laughs> I have added Holly Holy Love onto my one. I can't believe it. See, I hadn't heard that song in a long time, and it came out out of the blue like eight months ago or whatever it was. 
no, sooner than that. And I just, as a kid, I worshiped it. And then I think I forgot about it because it came on and I just about lost it. Wow. Wait till you hear how that song starts. All right. You're going to be like, how? And then I looked it up and Neil Diamond did say it is to, to still his favorite composition. Wow. And he wrote it for what up, not a man to his God, but a man, a sacred song between a man and a woman. But it feels like it's written to a God, but it's actually supposed to be that sacred, but written for a woman. Breaks my heart. It's so beautiful. So wow. simple. It's good shit, man. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, I think we awesome. should we should leave it there. I think we should too. I think that's a really Dang, good place bro, to Dang, bro, we stop. went for five hours. Yeah. Well, you were, no, we're, we're total. For three. We're so. total, because uh, we had almost four hours last time. Mm. So we're, we're way over five total. Well, and the thing is, the world has quite enough of me now. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. I would argue. I think it is. I would argue that there's never enough Trina Shoemaker. Thank you. I'm going to put that on my tombstone one day. <laughs> <laughs> Says um, Andrew. So normally, this is the time in the thing where I say what's happening next week. But what's happening next week is I'm starting a month off. <gasps> so you, you are closing it out for me. And this is a fantastic way to do it. Um, the idea is to take June off and come back in July. We don't know exactly what's going on. We're figuring some things out. Um, but yeah it just if you are interested in this and you're watching it on youtube or one of the other platforms make sure um i would think if you go register for the crowdcast event that will get you emails about upcoming ones is that right mark that is yeah and they can also you can go to puremix.net and uh there's a link for angie talks to awesome people on the home page you can go there and watch that space as well yeah um, yeah and you don't and have to you don't have to sign up or be a member of, of pure mix letters. though why you wouldn't want to i don't know but you don't have to do that to watch this but to get information about it yeah you want to be on the mm -hmm. on the mailing list because um yep. yeah yeah any free member too would also get a notification whenever we're right well there you go so. go sign up for yeah. free yeah get free stuff cool would that be i don't know is this is this like a season season one ending Thing? Well, I don't know because you started calling this batch season two because I took December off. So uh -huh. maybe it's between season two and season three. I'm just counting. This was number 40, no, 50, 49 or 51 or something. So it's just for the next one. Yeah. So the yeah. next season. Yeah. The, 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 the future season. The future season. In July. The season of July. And then in in many years, we're going to have a reunion like that Friends reunion thing that just happened. And it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Can I just say I actually enjoyed that? Because Debbie and I, when the pandemic <laughs> started, we actually watched every single fucking episode in order. Starting like <laughs> May of last year. And it took us months. We watched one or it's two a day. It's good television. It's they really funny. good. It was it, funny. It was inventive at the time. Yeah, you know, I mean, it 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 was it it was. I, I liked Friends when I watched it. I don't watch TV now because I don't have a TV, but I could stream everything. I know that. Um, but my book robbed me of all other anything other than work, taking care of my family, writing. So I I dropped out of all book reading, anything. I just it's weird. I'm I'm looking forward to getting back into the world of like where stuff happens in the now. Would you like to recommend anything to our, our fine listeners to listen to or read or whatever? Oh, I thought I was going to be like, well, the Makita. <laughs> yeah, or Power Tools. Yeah, Power Tools. I'm That's totally cool. Makita. I love their, you know, their battery. Their uh, impact screwdriver is a game changer. <laughs> I really love Makita tools. I'm fully backing mm -hmm. Makita. Um, All right. You know. That I no, as far as music, everybody's got to find their own path there. Well, no, let's um, go back into like Makita land. Like, what else? What else is getting you through the day? Because Makita, that's good. I'm a, I'm a Ryobi guy, but same kind of thing. Yeah, but Ryobi's the you know I'm gonna just say it as a slightly more of the poor cousin to Makita. Right? So he's a little more affordable. You're a fucking um, elitist. Makita, you're a power uh, tool no. snob. <laughs> I am a power tool snob. Um, the Makita, if you get their, you know, their um, 18 volt, I think it is line, the big battery line. Yeah. 
Well, that that's They're what the I got most in the expensive Ryobi. one, whatever. Yeah, but there's just something about that impact driver. You get the screwdriver and yeah. a drill, and the, uh, the the screwdriver is an impact driver. It is small and lightweight. And it's just the most wonderful impact screwdriver that I've ever used, and I've I've used many, and so and they're um just all of Makita's of that line. They're blower. Everything is just super fantastic. So you know what else they've um, got in that line that is badass is a greaser. So if you've got like we've got a, a digger, like a, a one and a half ton digger thing, and it's got like twenty grease points. And if you do it by hand, you're covered in the stuff. And this thing right? is it's amazing. It's and so the impact driver has that kind of like there's just a quality to it, and it's the weight and the balance. So the Ryobi's cool and it works great. But Makita's really thought about how does this tool feel to hold for seven hours? All right. Like mm. the weight and the balance is just really beautiful. Buy yourself their nice little set of the impact screwdriver and the uh, drill, the case, everything about it. You'll think, okay, this now, is, is this in shit. like a molded plastic case or this is in the box? No, this is in a soft. This is in a soft. It's a soft. Oh, the yeah. soft bag. Soft I just bag. posted a link to it in the chat for everybody. All right. Um, well, see, but that's going to be cheap as shit over in the states, and it's probably going to be expensive here. So I don't know. You know, it's not super cheap over here, but it's it's doable. But you'll never buy another one. It'll. Yeah. I had to save my hands because I love to do. My dad was a builder. I mean, in other words, I do building. I mean, I built like I mean real stuff like what, decks. What's the latest thing you've built? My entire front porch I rebuilt. All right. The back stairs on this the studio. And do you do the Anything? whole thing like you'll paint it everything, or do you like you build it and now someone else has got to paint it? No, I did. You I do it I, all. I do it. I demo it. I I go get this. In this case, I had to go get new you know stair runners and and then if it's something so big, I will get one of my builder man friends to be like, okay, I I, I need muscle here, but um, but it also ruined my hands, yeah. so I had to have surgery. Um, for trigger fingers and I really had to start thinking about what am I doing to my hands um, and I've got to take better care of my hands my whole keyboard for work here has to be it's tilted I got it on a hydraulic here look I'll show you so my shelf let's see if I can get this right pulls out it's hard to show you oh, there we go yeah but it's hard to see but I can raise it way up oh wow oh that's I can, that's and it's really hydraulic awesome. so that I can lower it way down and it's angled. You can't really see the angle and everything's opposite. Right. But I have it tilted so that it's practically in my lap, right on my knees. But you know, I put it up and down. My chair was real expensive. My arms are just right. My shoulders are completely relaxed. And um, and then the angle is like this, so that my hands are. Right. You know, I got my trackball and then my magic mouse and my hands are actually pointing down a little bit so that the whole slope takes all of it out of my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And because my hands go numb, they have neuropathy. I can't feel them sometimes. And that's from power tools. Wow. So be careful out there, people. Careful. Um, that's that's really awesome, actually. I'm going to think about doing this. Now he thing. wants to find uh, that. Can I, I'll send can, you real yeah. pictures of how Should I, I be embarrassed I... that my yeah, keyboard awesome. and trackball are on? I've got like an, an Ikea desk and it has a middle drawer that I've pulled out and put a piece of cardboard on. And that's what's got my keyboard and trackball. And I've had the same I'm, piece of I'm cardboard for six here. years. Here's that realm under my, my table is mahogany. You can see it under there. That. This is the, oh, you can't yeah. really see the I'll try to get some Oh, light good God, here. there's me. Don't, don't do that. The hydraulic. <laughs> don't kill me on camera. Christ. Can you see the hydraulic? My eyes, my eyes. <laughs> thing under there is a bit hard to yeah. tell, but there's this big yeah. hydraulic yeah. arm, yeah. right? And then, and I had to mount that on the, it's not meant for this purpose. It's meant for another purpose, but if you can see here, so yeah, I can slide, whoops, I can ugh, drop it down. Yeah. It disappears yeah. completely, pull it out, but I can raise it. All the way up this high if i want to stand and work yeah, for a little a standing bit desk yeah yeah and so but i, I made it myself anyway That's brilliant yeah it is. what is it the works. so there's a hydraulic arm yeah that you got well i don't know if hydraulics the exact right word but yeah the arm was expensive the arm was yeah, like 300 see, mark, mark needs to know yeah. where you got the arm because now he wants one I do. oh no i'm gonna i'm gonna spell this out for you with pictures and show you with bright light like exactly i made the wooden tray myself and you know secured it right. on there but if you don't tell mark where to buy the arm he's gonna lose his mind i'm gonna I tell did. you where i just okay. don't re i'm gonna I'm have to go and, right now <laughs> i mean i built this like six years ago so i just have to remember it was okay. at a you go back through like your receipts 
Yeah. It, Check your diet. I bought a steel case chair. Steel case makes the very finest chairs out there. They're just as expensive as those other studio chairs. The Aerons. I never liked those. Those yeah. messed up my hips. Steel those, case. Oh, I, yeah. I went through the trouble because, again, my hands were dying. And I was like, I need a real chair. And it was a $2,000 chair. And that horrified me. But I thought my mattress, I mean, I spent so much time in this. Right? And yeah. I've been told by an orthopedic surgeon, you need to correct things or you are going to continue to have neuropathy in your hands. Mm. And so my chair is stunning. Um, the whole thing is ergonomically correct. And it did, it saved my hands and my neck and the whole bit. So nice. I will spell it all out and I'll email it to you. What's nice. your email? Thank you. Mark at puremix.net. Mark with a K. Oh my God. Now everybody knows. Yeah, sign me up for spam, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah, right, this changer. is not as impressive. I I had this desk made when the Command Eight was a thing, and the person sunk the Command Eight into it for me, which was awesome when I had the Command Eight because it I don't know it like used to have really high slipping faders, and I never liked that, so it went down. But then I don't use that anymore. So I built this wooden slab. Well, I actually bought this wooden slab so I could put it over the hole. Just trying to. Nice. Stay with the conversation, but more more impressively, uh, for this streaming setup, I have two keyboard stands with pieces of wood to hold to hold stuff up. So this is my uh, desk because I don't I don't usually sit this way when I'm working at the speakers. Right. Yeah, because then the speakers. Yeah, you have to modify have this. stuff. And That's make a nice it piece stuff. of wood. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I like last shows. <laughs> yeah, it's like last day of school let's all compare yeah. our ergonomic desks my, my <laughs> desk is not ergonomic at all but i've been very very lucky to not have any carpal tunnel stuff with um with this and i've been using a trackball since 87 or something and it's just mine is a carpal tunnel it's this ulnar nerve thing it's this nerve that all right. controls carpal tunnel does these ones yeah ulnar does this whole back half of your hand and power tools, I damaged it. So where I got ended up with trigger finger where this finger got stuck down, mm. like in order to get it up, I had to bend it myself. And so I had to have that surgery. I, I don't know. He said it was ulnar nerve. It was like carpal tunnel, but just a different nerve. Right. But it's, I mean, this hand just still goes numb all the time, like completely numb. So I got to watch my shit. I do not want, you know, to end up like with crippled hands no. worse than they are. All right then. Nope. Yeah. All right, so, guys. Nikita. Uh there's there's right. a lot of people that are upset that DeWalt wasn't mentioned in the power tools. Um I love DeWalt. In there. I love DeWalt. I do. <laughs> but I had to choose and I went Makita. And the, that's although the, my circle saw is a DeWalt. My big, you know, but radio. That's, that's, see, but that's how they get you. Because yeah. all the battery stuff you have to stick with a manufacturer. Because mm. the batteries okay. are more expensive than the tools. Tell you what though, my big chop saw is also a DeWalt. So my my off of my plug-in stuff, yeah, my plug-in stuff is Dewalt. My battery op stuff is Makita. My dad buys this all for me. He's a builder. Right. So, but I love Dewalt. Ryobi, well, that's my jigsaw. All right. And my lawnmower. <laughs> I don't even know who makes my jigsaw. I think it's like an off-brand thing from like Screw Fix is the company here that does. Yeah, Dual and, and Makita are equals, but they got better. I love my chop saw. See, love the problem it. is I had the Makita at the very beginning of this, and the batteries sucked, and so I yeah, kind of had get, a thing against them. But I think all better. batteries suck then. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I you don't abuse your batteries. Like my batteries are for my that impact driver, you know, they don't get overused. If I got a job that big, I got my backup batteries, but the big stuff is all powered, you know, so. Yeah, yeah plug in. It, yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm gonna get my DeWalt out and do some shit with my chop saw just cause we talked about it. Now all I'm right then. It. All right, you go yeah, chop some shit. I'm gonna go chop yeah. up some wood. You this chop is just gonna keep shit. going in the chat. I'm chats. gonna drink <laughs> a beer is right. what I'm gonna do. Awesome. And then I'm gonna take a month off from this and I'll miss all you guys, but you know. But I'll be back in some form or another. But Trina, this was fantastic. This Thank you. certainly lived it. up to part one. Thank you. I'm it's so glad. Great. I love yes. it. You're the only one, so one I want to do like this. So I'm, I'm going to come back anytime you ask. All right. All right. Well, I'm hoping because we did this hearing panel with Susan and Chad and stuff last season, earlier this season, whatever. And I want to do some more panel type stuff too. Where Panel's cool. So hope we'll definitely get you involved. 
in that. Get me on with Chad. We'll have some fun. <laughs> I I will get you on with Chad because Chad will only do the panels. He doesn't want to do a one on one. So right. he'll so I got to come up with do, a panel. Will he do a panel with me? And I won't act stupid. Tell him I will not act stupid. I promise. Yes, you will. Yeah. <laughs> come on. I will. <laughs> I won't be able to stop myself. No, that's fine. Anyway. That's All fine, because right. Jackie will stop by like halfway through it anyway. Perfect. So, mm -hmm. hey, All right. I want right, to so... thank everybody in the chat room, too. Thank yeah. you for all the questions. Yes, and, and thanks yeah. to thank everybody who watches this who comes back week after week. It is, mm -hmm. I can't, I couldn't believe it when Mark said, no, we actually have thousands of people watching. And then every week, it's thousands of people. And I know they're not all there all the time, and it's cross platforms and blah, blah, blah. But the response has been amazing. And I've got to say, like when I do the research for these, I watch tons and tons of other interviews and I'll see amazing interviews that have been up for two years and have 147 plays. And it mm. just makes me really sad. And the fact that these are all in the thousands of replays on YouTube within a week is amazing. Mm. So thank you very, very much for doing that. Because obviously, I mean, I would love to talk to all these people anyway, but they're not coming and doing it just to talk one on one. So Thank you. Well, I'm coming yes. to talk to you. And All right. You, Mark, you're awesome. a rock star, man. All right. So do I sign off? Do I say goodbye? Yeah, we're all, we're all going to just, this is the usual. We wave and I mute it at the inappropriate time. and cut everybody Bye. off. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye, guys.